Good afternoon, members. Order. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Members' mobile phones must be set to airplane mode or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. The session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via live online streaming and on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. Agenda item one then is apologies. Are we any apologies this afternoon? All present. Thank you. Um, agenda item two then. Minutes of the 13th of May 2021, pages 6 to 15 of your pack. Uh, and the members content with those and agree that I sign them as being accurate? Okay. Agenda item three, then, is the declaration of members' interests. Members at each meeting, members are required to register relevant financial or other uh, interests in the register of members' interests. Does any member have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Is that included if you've been arrested? I um, don't think so. I plead the fifth on that one. Um, agenda item four is um, matters arising. Members have sent a uh, further reminder to Sue Gray. Uh, the County Office of Department of Finance on the 17th of May 2021 regarding the MOR regarding major capital projects and have asked for a response on return. I have heard that Ms Gray has now taken up her new role in the Cabinet Office in London yep. and her temporary replacement Mr Colin Boyle, um, I believe, uh, is the interim County Officer and we have access to this uh, overdue MOR. I'm sure you'll agree with me that this should not be taken for a reason for further delays uh, in this and very important issue. Um, so, members, to note that our fourth um, report of capacity and capability in Northern Ireland Service was published today, uh, uh, together with our press release. I think at least the Belfast Telegraph has covered it, as far as I understand. I did a radio interview this morning. Um, uh, but uh, other than that, I'm not aware of any other media coverage. No. Okay. Agenda item five then is correspondence, um, and Mr. Donnelly, Mr. Gray, Mr. Bingham are with us. Good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, I we have no correspondence this afternoon, uh, so we move on then. Um, and the next item we will hear is evidence on our seventh inquiry into speeding up justice. In attendance this afternoon are Mr Peter May, uh, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary of the Department of Justice, Mr Simon Byrne, the Chief Constable of the Police Service for Northern Ireland, and Mr Stephen Heron, Director of Public Prosecutions. Uh, can we also bring in the following who are attending the meeting remotely? Mr Peter Lunney, Chief Operating Officer, Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service, Mr Glyn Capper, Head of Justice Performance, Department of Justice, me, the Chief Superintendent Melanie Jones of the Police Service of Northern Ireland, who deals with criminal justice matters, Ms. Francis Keeney, uh, Head of Strategic Improvement Team at the PPS, uh, and in attendance, as I've said, is Mr. Donnelly, the Controller and Auditor General, and Mr. Stuart Stevenson of the TOA at the Department of Finance. Mr. Stevenson, can you hear us okay? Yes, <coughs> Okay, good, good afternoon. Can I also check if Mr. Lunney, Mr. Capper, um, Ms. Jones and Ms. Kinney can hear us okay? Yes, Chair. Yes, Chair, thank you. Okay. Yes, Chair. Okay. There is three voices at least there, so hopefully everyone is with us. Um, okay, then. So we move to agenda item six, uh, and it's our Agen uh, seventh inquiry, speeding up, speeding, uh, speeding up justice evidence session, pages two, 20 to 100 of your pack. Uh, and this afternoon, then, it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Peter May, the Permanent Secretary and the Accounting Officer of the Department of Justice, and Mr. Simon Byrne, the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland, um, Mr. Stephen Heron, the Director of Public Prosecutions, to the meeting in person, and those colleagues who are attending remotely. Um, good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. Um, Members, in your packs uh, are the following. The Northern Ireland Audit Office report on speeding up justice avoidable delay in the criminal justice system, dated 
the 27th of March 2018, at your packs, pages 20 through to 83. Department of Justice biographies, at your pages 84 to 85 of your pack. Um, Mr. Heron's biography is at 86 of your pack. Mr. Burns, 87 of your pack. Um, suggested questioning, 88 to 97. And suggested areas of questions restricted paper, 98 to 100. I will now ask um, Mr. Peter May, um, Mr. Byrne, and Mr. Heron to make a statement, and then I will open the session to questioning. Gentlemen, have you agreed a batting order, or will we just go with it as I have read out? I'm going to make a few introductory comments on behalf of the three of us, uh, so you're going to, and then you're, we're happy to answer questions. So you're speaking on behalf of the three, and then, okay. Um, we, we, figured, uh, we understood that you prefer short <coughs> introductory uh, that, comments. That's, a, that's okay. So that's, that's the way we, we planned it. Okay. Okay, floor so, yours, Peter. Thanks. So thanks very much for the invitation to discuss the Audit Office report on speeding up justice. Uh, delay is undoubtedly one of the biggest challenges facing the justice system. And as a priority for the department, its criminal justice partners and the criminal justice board. The speed that cases progress matters to both victims and witnesses, to their families and their communities, and it can also help offenders to better understand the implications of their actions in a timely fashion. This committee recognises that reducing delay is a challenging and complex issue and that reforms take time to embed and for their impact to be seen. There is no one silver bullet to resolve the issue and we are delivering a series of steps all designed to improve both delay and the victim experience. I can reassure you of a strong and shared determination to make improvements led at the most senior levels of the justice system by those who attend the Criminal Justice Board, including the Minister, the Lord Chief Justice and the three of us who are here today. You're aware that we prioritised delay for a long time. As an indication of progress, prior to COVID-19, the average overall time to complete criminal cases fell for five successive quarters, from 169 days in December 2018 to 149 days in March 2020. That's a 12% reduction and was the fastest time for four years. I believe it shows that our reforms are beginning to make a difference. But although overall performance was improving, we know that the time taken for some cases, particularly some Crown Court cases, remains high, and that is a particular focus. An important factor in these crimes is their increasing complexity. Whilst total recorded crime has remained reasonably constant over recent years, there have been significant increases in crimes that take longer to investigate and progress, like violent and sexual offences and drug offences. And there's no doubt that COVID-19 will unfortunately have had a negative impact on delay. However, in the face of those unprecedented challenges, the justice system responded quickly and innovatively to introduce improvements that will have long-term benefits, and we'll be happy to talk more about those during this hearing. In its report, the Audit Office provided some important recommendations. I thought it would be helpful to share some examples of the, some of the improvements we've made since that report was written. Firstly, the report acknowledged the work undertaken to develop a performance framework for measuring delay. We've continued to build on this by introducing new performance analysis dashboards, and these have been an important tool in driving improvements. Secondly, we've introduced case progression offices in each Crown Court region. Thirdly, we've introduced a, a committee, committal reform bill to the Assembly to improve the experience of victims and witnesses and help tackle delay. And fourthly, collaborative working, a key theme of the Audit Office report, uh, has been taken forward through a number of speeding up justice programme initiatives. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Crown Court case performance groups were established in 2019 and chaired by the judiciary in each uh, area. They bring together justice agencies and defence lawyers to lead performance improvements at a local level. Secondly, the Working Together Board, chaired jointly by the PSNI and the PPS, continues to drive improvements in file quality and the effectiveness of decision making. And following a successful pilot, the Indictable Cases Process, or ICP, now operates in all court areas. The evaluation shows that for cases from 2017 to 2019, these were 26% faster than similar cases completed in 2014-15. In summary, Chair, the Audit Office report rightly highlighted delay is one of the key challenges facing the justice. We all recognise that more needs to be done. But I hope that in this brief introduction, I've highlighted some of the improvements the system has made and is continuing <coughs> to make. Simon, Stephen and I are happy to try to answer all of your questions. Okay, thank you. Mr Hildich. 
Thank you, Chair, and very welcome this afternoon, gentlemen. Nice to, nice to see you. Uh, <clears throat> one of the areas of criticism has been the, the quality of investigation files, and I think I've, I've picked this one because I've been involved in a few locally constituency ways and, and, and have been brought to my attention. And I can see where public could be frustrated by the process. Uh, the quality of investigation files prepared for the PSNI and the way the PSNI officers work with their counterparts in the PS, PPS has long been identified as a shortcoming that uh, contributes to poor performance, as, as indicated by the report, going back some considerable time. I suppose, Chief Constable, from your point of view, why, why has this been allowed to, to happen and potentially fester on since the report three years ago, and, and what has been done about it? Well, thanks. I, mean, I, I think, um, obviously, some of the reasons in the past I, I, I sort of leave to others to explain, actually, because I, I think, that, to me, coming in uh, at the point I did and actually balancing some of my personal experience, uh, the Chair talked about biographies, but I've chaired criminal justice boards in, in two other places, in, in London and then in, in my last life. And I have to say that um, the level of sort of cooperation and collaboration I will see across this system, I actually think is pretty impressive. Stephen and I uh, meet regularly. We have a strong uh, working relationship, and that extends through uh, Peter's team and into the court service. And I think when you look at where we were and, and where we've come to, you can see some of the figures in, in detail where, for example, uh, you, you, you will be aware there's five stages, and you go back a few years. It would seem, for example, that going back, I think it's 2014, 15, it was an average of 10 days, and it's now 93. So at first, first light, you might say that's got worse. Our assessment actually is we were putting more in the front end to get files case ready to go to Stephen than in the past, where we might get a file into the system, but it would have too many deficiencies. So what we've done since then is, I would say, on a typical case now, and you referenced your personal experience, but there's probably, it would depend sometimes, but about five levels of checking. And the point of call, so the, 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 a victim might ring treble nine, there's an assessment to deploy an officer who will take a crime report, which itself is assessed, and either it is, it is closed early if there's no immediate lines of inquiry, but for the purpose of today, when it goes into investigation, there are then various routes to what we would call secondary investigation, i.e. trace witnesses, find the suspect, collect other evidence. Since the report in 2018, we have put in different layers to improve all sorts of different things that would affect Stephen's part of the picture, so that if you look at the first point of contact into then file preparation, We've now invested in case progression officers. We've invested in dedicated decision makers. They are sergeants and inspectors that look either locally how investigations are directed or actually act as a gatepost between us, the PPS, and look at standards. There was reference in Peter's introduction to the Working Together project, which is chaired by one of our assistant chief consuls and co-chaired by a colleague uh, from, the, from the PPS. That has a program of work that looks at things like uh, minimum file build, standardised requ requirements for a file before it goes into the PPS. So for example, if there's an assault case, have you, have you got evidence from the victim as well as medical evidence? Have you got the CCTV? So there's, there's been a lot of emphasis on quality. There's been a lot of ev emphasis on improved supervision. Uh, and then there's been a lot of emphasis on, 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 on less waste in the system. Uh, we do have a performance management system, which we might come on to later, where we will also track when, when, when a file goes from, from the police into the prosecution service, there will inevitably sometimes be either requests back for can we, can we see something or can you get more of that. But we monitor that um, regularly to see that all those requests managed so that, that there is a timely process for remedying sort of a, a, a gap in a file. What we have seen is that for the volume crime, which will affect many people that you might be talking to, we have two different processes across the country at the moment. In Belfast, which effectively deals with a quarter of the crime for the whole country, there's something called the case progression team. So that's 88 police officers that deal with the investigation for volume crime. So that's sort of things like burglary, theft, robbery, and things like that. They, they will actually gather further evidence, and then they submit the file to something called the occurrence management team that again quality assure it. They finalise all these sort of things to make sure the right forms are filled in. It's ready to go to Stevens colleagues. And then on the other route, we go down to different specialist teams. So it might be the race, rape case unit, it might be the domestic abuse team, where there are similar things done to, to ensure quality. 
When we looked at some of this uh, since the, 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 the report, clearly there was gaps around timeliness, so there's a performance regime that looks at that. But also one of the big things, and it's not unique to here, it's played out heavily in the last couple of years in England and Wales, is, is adequate disclosure. So again, working th with Stephen's team as well, a lot of emphasis on training about disclosure. So, for example, on, uh, on the specialist teams where disclosure is often more complex, um, training to make sure that disclosure is at the point of the start of the investigation, not sort of 30 days before the court case. So that to give you a snapshot, we've trained on an average year about 1,300 police officers in either from new recruits to establish teams of detectives or supervisors in all of these requirements. And we would estimate since the report, we've invested about £23 million of resource into these various levels of file development, investigation and checking. And that's out with sort of the bigger teams that you might be familiar <coughs> with, for example, the public protection branch or the terrorism investigation unit. So I think there has been a lot of front-end emphasis and it continues so that we do have, for example, a way of, which we've co-developed again with Stephen, a system called Causeway. So you can monitor individual team area, district or group performance around a whole range of indicators around foul ball, timeliness, uh, supervisory checks, is it going to be late if, if, for example, it's a file that might go out of time. And then we've recently introduced a sort of a, a, a pan-Northern Ireland, sort of, we call it a tier two measure for, for all the assistant chiefs to look at. So it's things like how many offenders have you got, for example, that are still wanted after 30, 60, 90 days? Because when you get into the, the, the sort of meat of this, Really, this is about a big funnel, isn't it? And how, whilst it's important to victims, the quicker we get offenders, the quicker we collect the evidence and get it into the system, the quicker it gets to Stephen's teams, and then obviously the quicker it's processed and into the courts. Mm -hmm. So there's a sort of a snapshot of some of the yep. things we're doing. No, thank you. And obviously, we'll probably talk about systems and performance shortly. But looking at the the, the human side of it mm. from a PSNI point of view, what? Would you have any criticisms, or are you looking particularly at, at that cool face at the front edge, whereby some of it may relate to human error or human practice, not maybe come up with a standard? Because that would mm. concern me from a local Castlebury point of view, mm. um, whereby England and Wales seem to be potentially in a much better place. But I, I wouldn't like to think that the officers in Northern Ireland are any worse off mm. than, than our counterparts across the water. Uh, do you identify that at all? Or? Yeah, well, I, I think firstly, the, the, for me personally and also professionally, I think the kernel of some of this is about, you know, P Peter touched upon it in his start, but this is also about a service to victims and victims' care. Yeah, yeah. Now, actually, you can take a whole chunk of work out before we even get to the criminal justice part of it about crime prevention, which has been a big emphasis we've, we've brought in the last couple of years because ideally you want to stop it happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. But put that to one side, I think... You know, uh, th th this, the whole interaction in the early phase with the victim can, can set the, the route or otherwise into a successful prosecution because you, know, you have the figures there that at times, particularly in Crown Court cases, there are delays. So that brings a different pressure mm -hmm. to keeping a witness informed, witness confident to give evidence and indeed um, the people that might support them in the process. When, when you look at error, we, we have things where we will, we will for, for example, routinely audit and monitor the first point of contact decisions, is the crime recorded correctly? The occurrence management team, which I talked to you a bit earlier about, they're based in, in four parts of the country. They will assess the level of harm in the crime and then try and allocate that to a, an officer with a requisite level of skills. So something like a shoplifting is more likely to go to a local policing team where you might have, for example, more probationary officers, but actually the skill set to investigate that is different to a complex rape or a serious assault on somebody. So we, we, we do all look at all that. We also track, for example, when, when there is sort of dialogue between ourselves, the timeliness of responses to Stephen's team, the, the sort of, and it, 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 can, it can vary from just minor, can you explain where this thing is, through to something more fundamental, that the, the file's been submitted without, without evidence. What we, we try and do, we, under the Working Together programme, all the files that we would ideally send should be ticked. Um, there are still occasions when officers will submit files directly through to the PPS that haven't gone through the gateway, so they will get returned. The latest figures I have, that's about 13%. So that's one of the areas at the moment to say, how do you effectively close mm -hmm. that 
so the route down so that it's it's bypassed the checking there are I think one of the other things when you talk about the front end and errors and things is the di district or area performance meetings which are chaired by a chief superintendent or a superintendent they will look at error rates they will look at timeliness and they will look at file quality and the we can't do it today, but we can see how in other ways we can facilitate it. But the causeway system does let you drill into. Mm -hmm. If I'm an officer that's routinely late in paperwork, we would be able to spot it. If, if for example, there's, a, there's feedback about poor victim care, you'd have ways of, 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 of tracking that. Mm -hmm. So that I'd like to think that in, in all that we're doing at the moment, there is a good dialogue, particularly between Stephen's team and I. So you're looking for good practice. You made reference to England and Wales, which is interesting, because you'll know from the, the report, sometimes like-for-like -like comparisons, are, that, that you get the sense that it's within the bounds of similarity, but different bits of law are there. But I think one of the things that's sometimes lost, we charge one in five of the people that commit crime. That's, less, that's double what you'd see in England and Wales. So our charge rate is about 20% of all people that um, are, are of all crime, whereas it's 7 to 10 per cent in England and Wales at the moment. So there are reasons for that, partly because there's more alternatives offered to police officers in England and Wales to, to deal with low-level crime outside the court system. But actually, I think in a message in terms of the victims, that, that's actually pretty impressive and been, and been stable. And in some of the, the key crime types that affect victims and are of acute public concern, so for example, domestic abuse, that charge rate has been consistently improving over the last couple of years. Okay, thank you. Uh, the report highlighted that there was no reliable performance information relating to the interface between the PSNI and the PSS. Mm. PPS, sorry. Uh, is that system now in place and what has been learned from it? Potentially Simon and Stephen, if it's possible. No, um, thank you for the, for the question. Uh, as Simon has outlined that there is great improvement since this report uh, was uh, commissioned and published in 2018. Uh, but it's continual improvement that, that we're working on. So we do have to, on occasions, look back at what we've tried by way of an improvement initiative and do a QA of that and see if it's worked. And if it hasn't, we tweak it. So we have got much better at doing that, I have to say, over recent years, uh, instead of looking back you know, at historic cases and what the problems have been. But the problems are emerging. You know, There's a big issue now with the amount of digital material that has to be examined. So as Simon says there, there is early engagement, and one of the concerns we have this report, the audit office report, is primarily about Crown Court cases. Mm -hmm. And the system is not, uh, it's adversarial, first of all. So you have, um, you know, DOJ would be part of the system of uh, devising criminal justice policy, uh, and the practitioners primarily uh, are the operational partners, uh, police, ourselves, the defence, courts, and the judiciary. So there's a lot of different moving parts in the criminal justice system. Uh, what we do have in common, as Peter said in his opening, is a commitment to ensuring that we tackle avoidable delay. And the word avoidable is important there because there, there will be, in cases, uh, some unavoidable delay just by the nature of them, the same in every jurisdiction. But as regards seeing how we're, we're doing, we, as Peter had outlined, we were going in the right direction pre-COVID. Um, that's taken a lot of work. The sort of criminal justice process, although we measure it in five phases, so. Uh, we do have performance measurement indicators for how we're doing in those five phases. There's a lot of inefficiency as has been highlighted in this report because sometimes matters have to go back and forth. So your first question was about uh, engagement on file quality and that's where we've really made big inroads. Uh, the ICP process that Peter referenced, the two principles in that, um, there's five principles but the two that in involve EPS primarily are early engagement with PSNI and early engagement with the defence. So the early engagement with PSNI is, as Simon has touched on, crime is getting more complex in the Crown Court. Um, the routine cases, there are evidential file standards agreed between us, so by and large, police will know what is expected in a file where they need more bespoke advice. Uh, we have a duty to get prosecutorial advice and engage with police early in that. But what needs to be done more is bringing the defence in uh, on the discussions about how we actually do a proportionate file build, because at the minute some of the inefficiencies um, that we're talking about come from over file build. So we tend to, the culture here is that policing ourselves work uh, not just on every reasonable line of inquiry, but how are we going to actually make sure that this case 
is robust enough to withstand a, a number of attacks from the defence or a number of challenges is that, from is, multiple is, angles. Is there a bar set then that you deem to be maybe too high or should it be lower? Or? Well, what we need to do now is move to a position, if we're going to be like England and Wales, and there's sort of four, if I, if I can explain what's happening in the Wales, uh, we'll probably come back to committal reform, but it took about 10 years to implement committal reform from 2003 to 2013. Then there was a review of efficiency in criminal proceedings in 2015. And it was identified four main principles. So getting it right first time, case ownership, uh, a duty of direct engagement, and consistent judicial case management. So those are the four principles we basically built ICP around. And then in 2018, we had a better case management handbook. So even in the wheels, you can see, you know, it's taken a long time to make the improvements that they have now. Um, we are getting there, I have to say, with with police um, and what I really think is the, it's the duty of direct engagement we need to move to now because what we've been doing has been on a voluntary basis up to this point and I think that we need to have a, just a little bit more structure around that. We certainly have some of the processes in place that should see improvement. What we really need to tackle now is the culture, I think, in a, in a different way than we have before. Okay. Uh, finally, Chair, uh, just on the, the issue of the indicable cases pilot, uh, which was in the report also, uh, it was suggested that it would maybe develop the you know, development of a, a better investigation file quality and more effective collaborative working between the two organisations. Uh, has that pilot been evaluated? Well, it, it, it has, but it, again, we haven't had enough because we've had that year of COVID disruption. Yes. Mm -hmm. There haven't been as many Crown Court cases going through, so um, it will evolve slightly. It's not in every case. ICP isn't every case. So um, the pilot that there was in 2015 um, was a geographical pilot, and then in 2017 we decided to concentrate on the types of offences that were actually quite linked to paramilitary crime. Yeah. Was that something that was linked into the pilot? That no, really what the pilot showed us uh, in 2015 um, was that there could be very uh, significant gains in terms of timeliness, but the pilot, if you like, had everybody prioritising everything, so right. you know, we had um, very close working between a small team of police and prosecutors, um, priority being given in forensics, for example, to um, exhibits that were being put in. Now, it produced tremendous results, but they're not really scalable because uh, you can't prioritise everything in the system. So in 2017, um, what we tried to do then was there was, I think it was a recommendation from Fresh Start that we concentrate on cases that were related to paramilitary crime. And we're not necessarily talking terrorist cases there, we're talking about the paramilitary crime that happened in the community. So those were. Basically criminals? Yeah, we had drugs, <coughs> drugs offences, maybe uh, violence offences, um, drugs being taken in, in and out of prison. Uh, we concentrated on those. So the figures that Simon talked about from 2017 to 19, we looked at those cases. It can be skewed somewhat because there is, as a report showed, there is a, an improvement in timeliness in charge cases as opposed to summon cases. And a lot of cases that were in that ICP evaluation were charge cases. Mm -hmm. So whenever we're looking at the next iteration of ICP, we will have to align it with committal reform. Um, and whenever that comes in, we will have an ICP process that will submit a sort of um, supplement and support committal reform. Uh, there will be about 25% of all indictable uh, cases in the Crown Court, that indictable only offences, will be captured by the initial phase of committal reform. And we'll have a bespoke ICP process to try and match that. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Can I just yeah, mention two quick sure, things, yes. Chair, just to build on, because you, you talked about the performance stuff, so we're interested, and in, we can follow up with this. But under the Working Together project, there are actually three strands of measurable performance proven, which is improved quality, improved effectiveness, and reduced delay. So there are, there are measures that will show across a range of different things about that relationship between us. And, and, and the PPS. So that I think quite an interesting. You, um, you'll come to your conclusions, obviously, but we've invested heavily in this this, this dedicated decision maker idea, which primarily deals with summary crime. But one of the measures there I thought you might find interesting is the percentage of agreement between our recommendations and prosecution, and then the PPS. So the baseline is set at 97%, but across the different different types of um, a crime. The, the average is 92, so over 9 out of 10 we're in agreement, so the variance is low. And even on the 
decisions where it's no prosecution. That's 96%. So it's shown actually in terms of the bit that Stephen was talking about, a police understanding of evidential test and the quality of the file, I think that's quite an interesting statistic. And then there was a piece of work done, and obviously Peter will probably come back to this, that COVID has skewed a lot of the, the trajectory for various reasons. But in last November, there was a dip sample of um, 100 not guilty investigation files, and that did prove some, some areas of learning, which we're now looking at, that go back to the original commitments under Word Together, but looking at supervisory standards being good enough making sure there's compliance with the agreed file bill because that reduces waste and actually looking at how we improve the team performance management at district level. So okay. we, that, that continuous improvement ethos, I'd like to say, is one that's there. Thank you for bringing that to your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Muir. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you all for coming along here today. And apologies, Stephen, I'm sitting behind you. Uh, I really appreciate you just coming here. And I think the fact that the PAC is considering this issue again highlights the fact that this isn't a simple issue that can be resolved easily. It's a complex issue um, and has lots of different parts to it all. Um, just a couple of things. Um, the, within the Northern Ireland Audit Office report that we're considering today, it, it made a statement that said the PSNI and the PPS share a view that the standard of evidence required in court in Northern Ireland is in excess of the standard required in England and Wales, contributing to the performance gap between the jurisdictions. I'd just be interested to see your views about why that is. Is it more the case that we want to make sure that we're bringing cases to trial, that you know, we're ensuring that the, you know, those who are guilty are convicted, or what is a bit more in terms of background to this? Because Northern Ireland is unique in many different ways, and that's quite a stark statistic or statement, really, to be saying. Yeah, certainly, yeah. I'm happy to address that. Um, I think one of the things we do compare very favourably uh, with England and Wales on is the conviction rate of the Crown um, it was over 86% last year, and it's usually around the 85% mark on either side um, for the last number of years. So quite often, obviously, whenever you get to the Crown Court, cases will plead uh, at some stage. And you can overbuild cases. You can have too much preparation put in them, which is obviously a big drain on, on resources. Um, it takes longer then for cases to get through the system, and that's not fair on anybody. Um, but at the heart of this, uh, I have to say, is the right to a fair trial. You know, we are all um, sure that there isn't um, more speed, uh, doesn't sacrifice the, the quality and the difference between an effective justice system and an efficient one, although there's some interrelations. So all of us, once we are doing all we can to move on with delay, um, certainly don't want it to be at the expense of um, maybe an example of the CPS in England of Wales where cases were moving that quickly they weren't able to look at disclosure which is unused material in the case yes. until quite late in the process and cases had to be reviewed and stopped while they were actually before the court which can obviously lead to crisis in confidence yes. so getting that balance right will require us working with the defence because whilst it's an adversarial <coughs> system and they have every right to defend their, a client and ensure that they can test the prosecution mm. case there does have to be early engagement to narrow the issue mm. Uh, that are being contested between the prosecution and the defence. Excuse me, Mr. Heron. I know it's very difficult, and it's, it's, a, it's a problem in terms of the layout of the, the room, unfortunately, in complying with the COVID regulations. We just need Sorry, you to speak in the mic, otherwise. <laughs> it, uh, I do apologise. Otherwise, your evidence may not be heard. Sorry, sorry. I'll move down. Um, move down. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Um, yes, well, we're just saying that we do need to involve the defence, uh, in, in perhaps a greater way than, than we have uh, heretofore. So. Again, it, it, none of this is new. It's been tried in England and Wales, and it's been a, a difficult and slow journey there. So it's an adversarial system, but you've got to get the defence in, because what you have in common yeah. is, you know, there is Article 6 is the right to a fair trial, and it should be, be within a reasonable time. So we do think there's room. If you look at them, um, Simon mentioned disclosure. There's a National Disclosure Improvement Forum in England and Wales that we are a part of, and the defence sit on that. So that's the sort of level of engagement we have. Again, um, pre-COVID disruption, we had Crown Court Liaison Committees, which were led by a very senior uh, criminal judge, and the defence were on that, and we, we had a protocol for dealing with um, vulnerable witnesses that was a product of that. So we do see that there is the mechanism there mm. for this, but if we're really going to tackle delay and inefficiency, we have to stop this uh, back and forth nature where we engage with police, anticipating what the defence case might be, 
um, and that might require us to ask police to get further evidence. But then actually we don't know what the defence are taking issue with yeah. until a much later stage. So you have to concertina the five stages um, to, to make sure that they're done much closer time because every time somebody has to lift a file, when there's been a gap between um, a prosecutor <coughs> reading a file, for example, asking police to get more material, it takes time for police to do that. It comes back to the prosecutor, they have to read it again. Yeah. Then the matter goes to court. The defence tell us what they're taking issue with. We perhaps have to go back to police again. We may have to go to forensics or mm. get a sort of medical report. All of those things, the back and forth nature needs to create an efficiency. So we have to front load the work yeah. and try to get it done in a way which we're actually truly collaborative, which yeah. is going to involve the defence in a, in, a, in a different way than we're doing at the minute. Yeah. I think it's an important issue in response that you've given. And I'm probably old enough to remember the history of policing and our courts and justice within Northern Ireland. And we're in much better days now in relation to that. But I think the issues in terms of the culture is still there in terms of that challenge and ensuring that human rights compliance within Northern Ireland. Not to say it doesn't occur in other parts of the United Kingdom, but I think there's more of an acute focus on that. And I think it would be unfair to criticise the policing and justice system for be taking cognizance of that issue and the need to ensure that there's that confidence in our judicial system, which has already been outlined by the Chief Constable and also by Peter, as around the need to do that. Uh, one other thing is just around COVID-19. So COVID-19 came along about over a year ago and it's had a dramatic impact on policing and justice. There's a significant backlog, obviously, around that, which is the only thing that can be blamed for that is the need to be able to protect other people's health around that. But has there not been some learnings around COVID-19 and how we can do things better? Yeah. And if we can try to embed that going forward, and if there's some examples about how we can do that, like, for example, you know, we're all used to Zoom. I didn't even know what Zoom was last March. But is there things that we're now embedding within our system which will actually allow us to deal with these issues? Yeah. I'll maybe pick up on that one to start with, and then colleagues can, can add. Um, I mean, you are right that we saw a substantial increase in the number of cases before the courts as a result of COVID. Um, so um, if I would say that in um, April, the 1st of April 2021, there were approximately 10,500 defendants in the court system compared to 8,300 at the 1st of April 2020. But at its peak at the 1st of October last year, we were as high as 12,000. So we have already seen a significant reduction in the overall number of cases through the actions that have been taken through the Criminal Justice Board and all of the partner agencies that are involved. And in particular, in relation to the Magistrates' Courts, we've made some quite substantial inroads into the backlog. It is more challenging with Crown Court cases. You'll understand that it's only recently that jury trials, yeah, relatively yeah. recently, the jury trials have been able to, con to resume and to resume at any, uh, in, 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 in bulk, and that that is more challenging. But you asked about what we've learned as a result of COVID. And I think you know, one of the key areas is around the better use of technology and dig digital platforms. So uh, we broadened the, uh, the use of live links within courts to ensure that where possible court cases can continue using remote access for defendants, victims, uh, and uh, witnesses. Um, there's an ongoing uh, operation of a range of new initiatives such as digital telephone systems, which the PSNI are leading on, review of court cases and no prosecution clinics, which again is a joint PSNI and PPS initiative. And colleagues here may want to say something more about one or more of those uh, initiatives that they've been involved in. But those are things that we won't just go back to the old way of doing things uh, when uh, the, the, the threat of COVID recedes, if the threat of COVID recedes. Um, we will look to, learn, to build on those and uh, to find new ways. And indeed, one of the other things that's been taken forward is around how digital evidence gets transferred from PS9 to the PPS, from, and then we have plans for PPS to the defence uh, and from uh, the, the PPS to the, to the court. Uh, those are plans that are in place well advanced. So those sorts of changes will make a big difference. You will, I believe, in a year or two's time, not go into court and see uh, barristers straining under um, uh, sort of three feet worth of paper many times. Many more times they'll be taking a, a tablet in or a, a computer in and uh, accessing the information they need through those means. Do you, do you want a few specifics? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, well, I suppose I think one of my reflections of, of the last 15 months has been about adaption and certainly 
the three of us and others, the main focus at one point at the Criminal Justice Board was how, how you kept uh, the system running, but also how you could adapt both for here and now and beyond. And I, I think there's been some quite encouraging innovations. So one is the remote evidence centres, which allows police officers to give evidence from police stations, so you're reducing travel time. Um, that's currently mostly used for high court bail, um, but the, the plan is to extend that for, for all hearings. Um, Mr Hilditch talked about victims before, and this is something I'm particularly keen on, the idea that, in a sense, rather than victims coming to the police, we fully come to you so that you can, you can, you can adapt in the way that you have a transaction in any other part of your life to being a victim, so that we would telephone statements and then <coughs> we can have a, di a digital signature. It might seem a, a, a bit it's taking you that long, but there's, there's impediments. Chief Constable, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, just on that point, if you, if you don't mind. No, yeah. it's okay, sure. I mean, realistically, mm. do the police have the resources to do that? Yes, uh, in fairness, because I think if you see that as things are operating in tandem, one of the big investments that, 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 that Peter knows that I, I've wanted to make since my time here is there's a, there's, a, there's a strategic case for more officers, but there's another one about digital policing. So if we can bring the sort of technology to frontline officers and staff that most of us have, have in our pocket or in a handbag or something like that, so that how we exploit technology so that uh, there's a, you may see, if you look at social media at the moment, an example is a, a trial which is growing at the moment of ruggedized laptops for frontline officers so they can come into your home, take a statement in your home and submit it back to a call centre or a custody centre probably faster than the prisoner you were just arrested is driving. So we all know in, in terms of the limitation of typing that you wouldn't try and take a complex statement for a, a sexual crime like that. But for sort of basic assaults, theft crimes, we, we, you know, that's something we would like to see grow this year. So far we've taken 90 digital statements using the new system to put in, in, into, um, into the prosecution service and clearly that will grow. There's frankly just an impediment at the moment on a licensing issue. I think uh, we can now uh, do voluntary interviews at the solicitor's office so the suspect goes to the solicitor and then there's a, like a, a, an online interview which again saves travelling time. Um, the, the interesting one in terms of volume, because obviously the, the, un, the underpinning bit of obviously the committee here is about productivity and value for money, is this, this system called BOX, uh, which is a stage development of the electronic transfer of information initially between us and Stephen's colleagues, and eventually that will then move into the defence. So apart from moving paper, you can start to move body-worn video evidence, CCTV images, so that eventually the whole file becomes an electronic file for both the system and then for the courts and the intention is to sort of progress that into the defence in the near future and then I think we may come back to this during the course of the afternoon but the other thing we've learned is the underpinning issue of a lot of this isn't it is the volume of work in the system and how do you shift it in other ways and I, I touched on before for example about the difference between charge rates here in England and Wales but but 10 percent of our work is on traffic crime so, for example, careless driving. So if we had a fixed penalty notice for careless driving, that will take out volume, which then creates more capacity to do with things that perhaps need more attention. Only yesterday I was with the Department for Infrastructure, Minister Mallison, Mallon, talking about that, where there's support to change legislation to enable us to do more fixed penalty notices for minor issues or for road traffic issues so that we can concentrate on more serious crime and harm within the justice system. But I think the innovation has been one of the, the sort of takeaways from COVID and we want to see that continuing. Just one last question that probably relates to that issue. Um, the committal reform bill is going through the Assembly. This place wasn't sitting for three years. It came back in January of last year and we all welcome that. Um, but how much will that committal reform bill have an impact upon what you're doing? Mm. And how much did the lack of devolution and the ability to pass legislation and have ministers in place have an impact upon the issues that we're talking about here today? Again, perhaps I'll pick up on that in the first instance. I mean, I think we believe that committal reform will make a difference in relation to delay. It is actually quite a good example. All of us have talked about the complexity of the justice system. And uh, I think the, the easy answer uh, and the, the big benefit that will be seen immediately on committal reform is that no victims and witnesses will have to give oral evidence at the point of, of committal. In other words, the risk that they have to give evidence more than once. Um, and, and even if in practice it doesn't happen very often, no. 
the fear it might happen yeah. is something that does affect a lot of victims and witnesses. But the actual implementation of committal reform, assuming we get the bill through that is currently before the Assembly, will take some time. It is a complex area. We currently have four separate work streams that are, are, are taking forward IT changes, uh, changes to court rules, changes to legal aid rules, and a, a bigger behavioural change uh, approach because this will affect the way fundamentally police and PPS particularly operate. And we do need to make sure that in making this transition, we are not simply transferring cases earlier to the Crown Court in order to gum the Crown Court up. Yeah. And Stephen has been a, a, you know, a really helpful voice on the Criminal Justice Board in trying to make sure that we, we understand that complexity and that we really address this in all of the different dimensions. So uh, after the, the bill becomes an act, it will be some time, it may be 18 months or two years before we're able to fully implement committal reform. Uh, as I said, we will take that first step on oral evidence immediately. But it is, for me, it's, it's something that will make a difference. We've seen in England and Wales, uh, Stephen said it took 10 years in England and Wales to properly uh, uh, roll it out. Um, uh, but we have seen that it has made a difference in England and Wales, despite the fact that initially people were very sceptical about whether it would make a change or not. I don't know, Stephen, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, I think you, you've been fairly comprehensive there, Peter. But certainly we see that um, great benefits in abolishing the uh, oral evidence of committal because Really, what you're doing there, from a victim perspective, is sometimes they have to give evidence twice. Yeah. So um, we've given evidence previously to the Justice Committee about that, uh, specifically uh, the, the additional trauma that first and foremost for victims and witnesses. And we don't think it serves any benefit. We think the checks and balances that there are in the Crown Court ensure that if the defence have any issues with the prosecution case, they can be tested there. Yeah. Don't need uh, to have a contested committal hearing where there's oral evidence in the magistrate's court. And quite often we would have seen actually that um, a complainant, a victim, may have been asked to give oral evidence, but whenever he or she actually turns up at the magistrate's court to do that, they're not required and the case goes through. And obviously that adds to the stress and trauma of somebody who is going through the system. So it will make a measurable um, a contribution to actually tackling delay. I think it's going to be the single biggest um, a sister to us getting cases into the Crown Court more quickly. But as Peter has said, we need to ensure that we're match fit for that. And part of that is that the things that we're doing on a voluntary basis at the minute, say the, the engagement between ourselves and police, the engagement between PPS and the defence, have to become mandatory. Uh, and the principles I talked about, about getting it right first time, case ownership, direct engagement, effective case management, will all have to be in place because, as we have found in, in England or Wales, as I referred to, uh, proceeding at speed can also come at a cost to actually the principles of justice yes. and ensuring there is no miscarriage of justice. And that's the balancing act that has to be done. Certainly, we have a long way to go in, in mm. trying to uh, get cases into the Crown Court more, more quickly. But the Lord Chief Justice uh, has made it very clear, I think, to the Justice Committee that that's what we need to do because that's where they can be effectively case managed. And for want of a better uh, analogy, the defence and prosecution get their heads butted together. If they haven't already got things sorted and the issues narrowed, having a judge there that is making you do that, I think in the Wales has been the most effective way of making sure that there's success. Yeah. Probably recall the first job I ever had in the 1990s and the first day I started I was told by the manager, either do something correctly and do it properly, just don't bother doing it as well. <coughs> And I think that's the case around this here. There's, you know, do something half-hearted, and you'll feel the consequences of that afterwards. So, um, I think it's notable that, that that committal reform stuff was done in England and Wales a number of years ago. So we're now catch up here. You know, now devolution's been restored. We're now trying to do that. And even as you said, if the bill is passed, that's just the start of a whole process. So I think it's important to note that. And some of us recall that in the Justice Act 2015, there was an attempt made to. Well, there was some legislation passed in relation to committal reform, but the attempt was made to go further and to abolish oral evidence. But at that time, the Assembly didn't agree that there was a proposition by Minister Ford at that time, and that wasn't accepted. But um, we believe that, that there is now a wider acceptance of the need to abolish committal reform. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms Flynn. <coughs> yes, um, thanks very much, Chair. And Thanks to the um, panel for your attendance at committee today. Um, so I'll maybe just pick up some some of the a couple of the points that um, I noted down as as you were speaking in answer to previous questions. Um, Peter, in your opening remarks, you had mentioned um, 
So it's good to hear that obviously it has been a priority um, for the, the, the department um, to deal with the delays for a long time. And that 12% reduction um, certainly is showing improvements, which, which is good to note. Um, but in, in the report, um, it was pointed out, um, it was highlighted that the, the poor quality case files from the PSNI, some of those were highlighted as far back um, as 2006. And I know that you had mentioned, um, it's been mentioned a few times, that there has been this increase in complexity around the cases that you are dealing with. And um, I'm just wondering, so is it a case that, um, you know, the, the crime here locally, um, that, you know, um, the sort of the crime patterns are shifting here? And is that something that is specific to, to us here in the north or is, you know, different parts across Britain, you know, seeing some of those same patterns and undergoing some of those same challenges as a result of the, the complexity of the cases? That's my first question. Thank you. It's probably best if, it's, uh, if, if I take that to start with. I, I think that's a really interesting point, actually, because what we've seen here is quite stark changes in the patterns of crime over the period of the report. So that to, to, to give you sort of uh, year end 2019, because we're trying to keep it consistent with some of the reporting periods, but violence against the person had gone up 40%, uh, sexual offences 84%. Possession of weapons, which frankly is a reflection of police activity, nearly 50%, uh, and, and, and then drugs offences, 125%. So you, and then the, what you might expect is more traditional types of crime, be it theft, robbery, burglary, have, have fallen, and that pattern has continued up to the present day. I think the really interesting point that is hidden behind this, though, you've got a shift in the type of crime. But we touched on before about the need to get the right sort of evidence and to get disclosure right. But again, I, I think personally there are some really stark other facts that go with the change in nature of crime, which is the online element to an investigation. And that's not to say about scam type crime where I use my computer to try and trick you into being my bank. But because of the nature of life these days, there was often a telephone footprint or something similar to crime. And, and some of the changes are enormous. So violence against the person, the percentage chain where, the, where there's an online element, and that would include harassment type cases, that's 624%, so that there's a need to examine a phone. Um, sexual offences, the online element to that has gone up 325%. Um, they sort of, uh, some of the th issues around drug crime threats, similar, similar scales, so the overall impact on us has been nearly a 500% increase between 2014 and the end of 2020 on that online element. But the other thing that goes then with it is that you might say, obviously, that's a change in nature of work for the police, but we've invested at the same time in uh, cyber investigation units. So there's the 60 officers do that at different sites across the country. So that on average, to give you some sense of what that means, we would examine currently last year's figures um, for, the, for the year end, 4,600. 777 mobile phones, 904 computers, and 11,000 plus items of CCTV. So that it's think again that that is that is significant. But there is some good news here because on investment, there's been a lot of work put on first point of contact triage, and we have had working with with um, with colleagues some significant reductions in backlogs and timeliness for examination of devices. So that. Um, 2019, it was taking 27.4 days to examine um, a, a typical mobile phone. At the end of 2020, January 2020, it was just five days. So that, again, is a, is, is, is a big change. The backlog of, um, of, of devices in the system has gone down by a third, and the backlog of computer uh, in the system has again gone down by a third. So that while we have identified problems and changes, we've also adapted our tactics to meet that. Now, well, there's always more to do, but I think they're quite stark figures and shows really how our life has changed in the period of reporting because so much is now maybe proved by some element of mobile phone imagery or, or something akin to that, or at least it puts a suspect somewhere near a crime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thanks for that, Simon. And, I mean, some of those statistics are really reassuring. I mean, even that, you know, the mobile phone going from, in a short space of time, from 27 days down to five days. I mean, you can certainly see the progress around there. 
but just reading when you mentioned they're around so the investment into some of these initiatives um you have quoted um earlier in your remarks 23 million pound mm -hmm. of investment was that more specifically in relation to um the the case phase and trying to speed up that process or was that taking into account some of the facts and figures that you mentioned there as well around the the IT element and the cyber element of this? Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's a blend of both. So, for example, the, the total cost at the moment of the cyber support units is just shy of £4 million pounds out of that £23 million. So, again, through the chair, I mean, if you want further information on the breakdown of the £23 million, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a combination of the file build, but then the specific bit around the uh, digital examination as part of that mm -hmm. new cost that's gone in. OK, thanks for that. Um, and then if we could just go back to, um, it was mentioned a few times also around the case progression officers that are in place now. And I'm just wondering, Simon, you had mentioned the number of 88 officers earlier. So is that, is it 88 in total case progression officers? <coughs> and when were these um, posts first introduced? Um, yeah. And I think you had gave earlier, Simon, a sort of breakdown of what their, their role was around you know, finalising the forms and setting then, you know, the information onto the specialised team. So hopefully that's streamlining some of that process. But mm -hmm. when, when were those, is it 88 um, case progression officers and when were those posts first introduced and are they going to be a long term um, uh, post as well? So the, eight, the figure of 88 related to a specific specifically to police officers who were involved uh, in case management. And Simon can say a bit more about those 88. But when I talked earlier in my opening remarks about case progression officers, that's, those are um, uh, civil servants who support the judiciary in uh, key areas. So there was a pilot initially in, in Belfast and in Craig Avenue and Newry, so in two Crown Court areas. And we've now introduced Crown, uh, case progression officers in each of the six Crown Court regions. So there are six case progression officers in, in Antrim, in Belfast, in Coleraine, Craig Avon, Dungavon, uh, Dungannon and Newry. And so they are there to try to remove some of the administrative burden from the judiciary, to try and interface between the, particularly the PPS and the defence to test, the, make sure that cases are more ready to progress at the next hearing or to understand the challenges that might exist. So just to clarify, those six are separate from the 88 that Simon talked about. And Simon, you might say something a bit more about your officers and how they operate. Yeah, thanks. That's one of the sort of issues of the system. There's a lot of uh, jargons and acronyms, isn't it? So, um, but the case progression teams are a Belfast initiative that came into place in 2018. But, so they will cover all, all the crimes within the Belfast district. That, that, that meet there, so that, that they deal with volume crime effectively, so your theft, burglaries, robberies, car crime, that sort of thing. And that's where the AT figure comes. There's then a separate model for the, for the outer Belfast areas because of the different geography and things, and they're called the volume crime support teams. They have 67 officers in at the moment, but there's some work going on because their terms of <coughs> reference are slightly different to see how we harmonise that, because I think there's a lot of confidence in the Belfast model. So the Assistant Chief Constable that leads on Criminal Justice Force at the moment is looking to see how we get the best standardisation across the country. But the roles are similar but marginally different, so that we're looking at how we can adapt that in the, in the months ahead. Okay, thanks for that. And then just finally, um, maybe this one is for Stephen. Um, Stephen, you had mentioned earlier around the Crown Court Liaison Committees um, that were in place pre-COVID. And my question around that is, um, so first of all, did those liaison committees, have you found that those helped in speeding up um, the, the, the process of the court hearings when, when they were in place and they were activated? And obviously with COVID then, that's had an impact on them. Um, but do you have any plans to resume the work of those committees if they were helping to, to help sort of streamline the process as well? Thank you. Yes, uh, certainly that, that was a judicial initiative the Lord Chief Justice had introduced um, two different groups actually. There was a Crown Court Liaison Committee, which is really trying to get a consensus amongst the sort of PPS, um, the judiciary, the defence and other interested parties, including the courts, about how we could more effectively deal with certain case types. Um, so there was a practice direction came out of that to help us deal with vulnerable 
uh, witnesses in particular, but it was trying to put a lot more structure about when the defence and prosecution would take various action to get cases before the court in a, a way that they were sort of case ready. So it's based again on the principle of fewer more effective hearings. And then there were Crown Court performance groups, which were chaired again by judges at local level to try and see what, you know, if there were any issues in particular court areas um, that could be resolved locally. So both of those, because of COVID, uh, were suspended, but uh, I know Lord Chief Justice of the last Criminal Justice Board has plans to get those up and running. And I do think they provide a basis for us to move to the next phase that we're required for a committal reform uh, of, of building on that. And we'll, we'll need to look at sort of Crown Court rules and further practice directions. Uh, and I think that's a, a very appropriate vehicle to uh, get that work delivered through. And one of the instructions right. is just to say something Thank more you. about the performance groups, particularly which meet in each local court area. They will get a set of uh, performance data for their area that will demonstrate how long different cases are taking and will also benchmark those against the Northern Ireland average. And that then provides essentially an element of an, an obvious opportunity for people to say, well, why is it that our area is so much slower than another area in respect to this type of case or that type of case? And it should really act as a really good incentive for performance improvements. I mean, it's, it's a form of competition, I guess, in, in one way or another. Yeah, people naturally don't want to be the, the slowest. They want to try to be at the top of the, uh, the, the league table, as it were, um, subject to Stephen's points about maintaining quality <coughs> of, of performance a, along the way. Um, so those, those performance groups, we think, have the opportunity there. As Stephen said, they haven't met for the last year, but they, they will be starting to meet again shortly. That's great. Thanks very much to the panel. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Can I just ask a few questions? In terms of the, the number of cases waiting to go to the Crown Court, um, is, it, is my understanding, are they up by 50 per cent? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I have that figure. Just uh, to hand, Chair, um, let me see if I can find it. Um, there are some figures about... Um, I do have some figures. Just a question of trying to identify them at, at, in the moment. Well, it, well, while you're looking for that, I mean, if, if that's true, and that's my understanding, I mean, what what is the reason for that? Well, I think if we go back to um, what was happening in the courts at the time, the lockdown came in in March last year. That there had to be, there was a need to focus on urgent business that was before the court because obviously. It, the message was work from home and a lot of public buildings were closed down because mm. they weren't mm. sort of compliant with the health and safety guidance that was in effect. <clears throat> so normally there would be 12 Crown Court running throughout um, Northern Ireland uh, dealing with the about an average number of about 1,500 cases a year. So uh, right up until from March um, until the summer of last year, there wasn't any Crown Court work done that um, because Obviously, they, they had to adapt whenever you're bringing a jury in for a Crown Court trial. Uh, there's a lot of space, court space needed, so there's a lot of work had to be done, um, led by the judiciary and the court service to adapt courts. But, but OK, I accept that point, but are you saying that the 50%, the, the um, I mean, it, it, is that figure, does that figure sound right? There's certainly a, a significant increase in the number right. of Crown Court cases. Are you, are you saying that 50% is entirely down to COVID? The, the jump um, compared to the figures, I, I quoted some figures earlier about um, cases from a, comparing April 2020 with April 2021, and the difference in those figures is absolutely down to COVID. But what I'm asking you is, is the 50% entirely down to COVID? I, I, as I said, I'm trying to find the precise figures for the increase in 20, the difference between April 2020 and April 2021 mm. is down to COVID. There have been, um, uh, in, in relation to Crown Court cases more generally, I think we've, we've recognised that we've made some quite good progress in relation to what's called Crown Court charge cases, and we've been able to reduce the amount of time taken for the average case in those areas quite significantly. And it's actually now the, bet the best it's been since recording uh, of the data began. Okay. But we have a big problem in relation to some okay. of these cases. C could I ask you, between yourselves, to confirm the 50% figure? In writing to us, and um, of course, and, and and the reasoning behind that. Um, I mean, 
I understand again that the average court case in terms of the Crown Court is adjourned six times in Northern Ireland. I mean, how does that compare to the mainland, and why is that? Well, it's uh, the big matter in the mainland is fewer, more effective hearings, um, and I think part of the reason uh, we've already touched on before, perhaps, is that whenever uh, you're looking at England and Wales, because they have committal reform, because they have got that duty of direct engagement, there is an expectation when cases come before the Crown Court that the defence and prosecution have worked to narrow the issues between them and that really what there should be is one hearing pre-trial and then it should move on to the trial hearing and there are exceptional circumstances if you need to come back to the court between that. But that's the ambition of us all here is that we would have fewer and more effective hearings because they're obviously the most expensive part of the criminal justice system. Is the figure of, is the figure of an average of six times accurate Mr Heron? I, I have no reason to doubt the data on that. I, I don't think it's but, inaccurate. But what do you think the average would be in the mainland then? Say for England. I know they're different. I know Scottish judicial system is different to, to England, but say for an English region. So my understanding is the average for Crown Court cases, for all cases in the Crown Court, for the number of adjournments is nine here, and that was. Uh, that was higher. Nine adjournments. Nine adjournments. It was eleven ten years ago, and it's reduced to nine. So not every adjournment is a bad thing because there is a case management process that is gone through by the judge where he, they, call them, uh, they bring cases forward for mention in order to understand the progress that has been made and the, the next steps that are needed. <coughs> uh, the, the real challenge comes when you end up adjourning a case that would normally be ready to go uh, to trial. So you know, is it an effective trial or what's called either a cracked or an ineffective trial? And in that respect, um, we again have made progress. Um, we're currently in a situation where 57, 58% of cases are um, actually proceed to trial on the date that they're supposed to. Um, and that used to be 43% 10 years ago. So again, a substantial increase. We still have more to do to try to reduce the number of cracked and ineffective trials, the number of trials that for whatever reason collapse on the day or need to be rescheduled mm. for a later date. But adjournments, um, are a challenge if, if there is an ex for example, if the victim or the witness expects that something is going to happen on that day that is going to require them uh, you know, to hear evidence or to give evidence and it doesn't happen, then that is clearly a much bigger yeah. problem I mean, than having an adjournment that's part of a planned process to bring the case yeah. forward. Except that you're saying we're down from 11 to 9, but 9, an average of 9, indicates to me there is a culture of adjournment in Northern Ireland. That be for well, as I said, there is a as part of the case management process. You'll see a lot more adjournments in charge cases because they enter the court system earlier on. It is, of course, something we would like to reduce. If you reduce the amount of time it takes to bring cases forward, you will uh, you will you will of course reduce the number of adjournments. So I'm not I'm not defending nine as being a good number. I don't have a number for England yeah. and Wales to compare against. I'm afraid, Chair. I yeah. can see whether we have that. Yes, yeah, so if you could if you could do that, be, but, but I just think. To be fair, and I'm not trying to be hypercritical, but, no, no. but nine adjournments on average sounds like a culture of adjournment to me. Um, in, in terms of the, the going forward, it um, seems to me it's a four-legged stool, and you're three legs of that stool. And I accept absolutely that, uh, that Her Majesty's uh, judiciary are independent, absolutely. But is there a sufficiency in joint upness? Uh, and, and cooperation to ensure that the, 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 what we're talking about here in terms of delivering a better service, because this is hugely important in terms of dealing with criminality, uh, not least criminality in Northern Ireland, given our history. Is there more work can be done? Is there more work being done to improve that? I accept the Lord Chief Justice will be uh, absolutely guarding the independence of the courts. That's a given. But is there more work ongoing? Can you assure us that that work's ongoing and we're getting, going to get a better system at the end of it? So I, I think the answer I would give you is that, yes, there is an awful lot going on to improve that system. The Lord Chief Justice is a, is a member of the Criminal Justice Board. In fact, you know, I want to recognise the fact that he's brought forward a number of the ideas that we're talking about today in terms of initiatives to improve the operation of the justice system. And through the committees that Stephen talked about earlier, the Crown Court Liaison uh, Group and the Crown Court Performance Groups, 
That is a way of managing both at the, the liaison group at the Northern Ireland wide level and the, the progression groups at a local level, managing cases on a much more um, regular and bespoke basis. So there is, there is I believe, um, good grounds for uh, uh, us being able to say that we are making progress in the right way. There is, of course, uh, always a question about whether, and this will ultimately be a, a question for ministers, about whether or not to introduce a system of statutory case management. Um, and the, the 2015 Act did enable such a system to be introduced um, in, and, and has not, to date, um, been taken forward. Um, it's notable, I think, in that connection that uh, Sir John Gillan, in his report on serious sexual offending, felt that uh, to introduce statutory case management would be overly prescriptive and uh, uh, wouldn't serve the, uh, the, the, the benefits. So essentially what we're trying to do is to establish a case management framework um, which uh, will enable progress to be made. Uh, and uh, it's not off the table, it's something that can be come back to in future. Um, Stephen has talked about some of the other steps that uh, are necessary in relation to uh, ensuring case management following the principles that you uh, outlined from, from England and Wales. I don't know if you want to add anything to what well, I've said. Certainly, if we're talking about judicial engagement, um, I do think there is a high level of judicial awareness uh, about the role they have to play in ensuring cases are progressed effectively. And we have a we had a legal aid dispute that ran from about uh, May 15 to February 2016. Not ex an exact template for how we would um, sort of deal with a backlog of cases, but I know from having dealt with several judges that they are acutely aware of the impact it has on victims and witnesses, and they are trying to ensure that cases that involve the most vulnerable yeah. are, are given priority. So it, you know, being a judge isn't easy. Um, you know, you do come in for a lot of criticism about the fact that their independence is <coughs> sometimes seen as some distance from the rest of us, but uh, I can certainly vouch for the fact that the Lord Chief Justice is a, uh, a very committed participant within the Criminal Justice Board and the judges I have mm. dealings with are equally committed to ensuring that they play a very effective role in case management. You know, the impact of delay in justice obviously has a huge impact on the individual, but it also has a huge impact in terms of public confidence, and you don't need me to tell you that, given ongoing current uh, issues that are out there at play at the moment. That's now below 50%. That's cause for concern for everyone in Northern Ireland. And so therefore, in terms of deterrent for those who want to go out and, and perform acts of, of, of um, criminal nature, whatever they might be, is something which we all need to see uh, as public servants in various roles here addressed to give that confidence back to people. Uh, and I think one of the things that the Scottish um, uh, administration has done is they've, they've shortened time limits in terms of um, cases and imposed those. I mean, is that something we're looking at doing? Um, so let me just start by talking a little bit about the COVID recovery piece that you mentioned and then come on to the, the last question that you raised. So I found a, a, a I don't have the, the stat for the number of cases, but I found something that says there are 330 more defendants uh, uh, who are awaiting trial in the Crown Court than was the case a year ago uh, in, in April 2020. Um, we have, um, as, as Stephen said, already begun, um, the, the Crown Courts are now operating, as many Crown Courts are now operating as were operating pre-COVID, and there are plans to introduce two further courts by September uh, 2021, and we're working hard to try to deliver that so that we can, be, we can uh, make a, a, a dent on that backlog. We have, through the Criminal Justice Board, mounted a COVID recovery bid, which is before the executive today, and I, I, I'm sure they've reached a conclusion, but I don't know what the answer to that was, but we are hopeful that we will secure some additional funding to enable the extra work uh, to be taken forward. Our current estimate is that the magistrate's court business will be recovered. Um, if COVID doesn't get in the way, the magistrate's court business will be recovered during this financial year. In other words, we'll be back to a pre-COVID position by the end, by March 2022. Um, we expect that the Crown Court will take longer. It could take up to two years for the Crown Court to be fully recovered. Uh, and we are looking at ways in which we can improve that. Okay. You mentioned time limits, just very briefly. Um, I know that in England and Wales they've actually increased the amount of time. They've had to increase the amount of time 
for, for cases because otherwise uh, cases wouldn't be heard. I've not heard that in Scotland they had reduced the amount of time, but they do have a system of statutory time limits. We have looked at such a system here. Um, it was initially planned for youth cases, but in practice, because of the other work that's been done, and, and Simon mentioned um, crime prevention earlier, but early intervention in youth cases means we have far fewer youth cases now, so actually it would not make a big difference to introduce yeah. time limits for those cases. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the mention was made earlier, Chief Consul, about files being prepared for the PPS, and I've spoken to many of your officers on the ground and their frustration around the fact that you know, dual criminal is not pursued through and, and, and given a custodial sentence or whatever. Um, in terms of um, those files uh, and reading the report, some of them were talked about being of poor quality or worse. Can we be sure and confident that the PSNI are actually involved in providing effective training for officers to ensure that this statistic is addressed and that files will go to the PPS that will actually ensure prosecutions? Uh, well, well, yes. I mean, at, at the end of the day, there's, there's always a, a bar to raise. And I think there's some, there are some competing statistics before I go on to the training thing, because you mentioned about confidence, which I think the last figures I've got are 45% over the overall system. But in the same period, actually, it's one to sort of try and understand that satisfaction with the system has actually gone up. So whether you're a victim or a witness, it's, you know, there are various figures. But you know, witness satisfaction is now actually at 80%. Victim satisfaction 64 was 62, and overall satisfaction has gone up from 65 in 08 to 73 per cent in 20. So there are some interesting contradictions. But I touch it on the on the introduction, and and absolutely, the the emphasis on on training and quality has to, has to be paramount because um, we talked before about this being a funnel and things go in the system, and there's various bits where, where you can get error, be it um, forensic submission timeliness, file quality, but we will train obviously at the point of recruitment. Uh, we, we trained 600 specialist officers last year in disclosure. So for example, there is an ongoing commitment um, to make sure that we're abreast of legislative change. So for example, a lot of difference now around the rules around stalking and harassment, as well as procedural change. And also you have the dialogue between uh, PPS and ourselves on a specific case, so that, that also adds to the sort of the layer of quality mm -hmm. assurance. But I think what we've seen certainly over the last couple of years in the Working Together programme is far more emphasis on the front end and getting that right. And those things we touched upon before about the guidance to officers about what is the minimum standard for a file, what should be in there and what shouldn't, because as Stephen said earlier, uh, but it's a point worth repeating just as much as sort of. Uh, a, a, a late file which has deficiencies is a problem. So is over file build, because you're just putting wasted effort in that still delays things. So there is a lot of dialogue. There is a lot of emphasis on uh, supervisory checking, making sure time limits are met, and it is performance managed at, at district level. And we are introducing, as I said earlier, greater scrutiny across the whole organisation. So, Mr. Mr. Hearn, are you seeing that in the PPS that uh, what the Chief Counsel was talking about is actually manifesting itself? cases are presented to you? We do. We do. Uh, I suppose a specific example uh, I think it might be useful to illustrate Chair, is through our, we've got a serious crime unit that deals with um, murder cases and serious sexual offending. And what we've introduced from uh, 2019 there is a gateway approach. So that's our bespoke model for because um, sexual offences in particular are some of the cases that are very slow to move through the Crown Court. Um, we put considerable resources, both police and ourselves, in making sure that whenever the file comes into us, it is ready to be directed on. So the investigation by police, um, there we're seeing great improvements in the number of cases that actually have everything that's required. Where it's not at that standard, uh, there is liaison then between our gateway team and a gateway team on the police side. So before there's actually um, a file passed to the prosecutor to look at, the gateway team, which is allowing the prosecutor to work on other material, is working closely with police to get that file ready for a decision to be made, which is going to uh, cut down on this back and forth nature between us where we get a, a file that maybe isn't complete and we have to do what's called a decision information request to police, which has a number of outstanding inquiries on it. We're seeing big improvements 
in the quality of file coming through that bespoke approach, and we're looking at how that could be scaled up uh, to be replicated elsewhere. Okay, I'll pause for there at the moment. Mr. McHugh, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Rob. Like, he's all very welcome here this evening as well, too. Thank you. Uh, many of the questions that, that I was hoping to ask have actually been covered as well, too. But uh, consistent with uh, just a comment that's been made, even in relation to um, uh, adjournments and that, uh, and about um, uh, poor case management and poor case files, which seems to be very much a historic problem. Uh, and, uh, and again, too, probably then in relation to the issue that was raised there by Chair, I, uh, that uh, training probably is required in that whole area. But to, to what extent does that affect you in achieving uh, your objective of getting it right first time? It was that was that for me? Do you want to take that yeah. Well, well, certainly, I think it was uh, Andrew before talked about his experience of well begun, half done. I think it's the Christopher Robin approach, and that's not to sort of sound flippant, but right first time is hugely important because it's, it does speed things up. So, the right first time I touched on before in relation to the the the, uh, the, the chair's question, but for last year alone, if you recognise disclosure has been an issue that is affected here in England well. 600 officers changed, uh, trained in the most up-to-date disclosure techniques. 1,380 police officers trained in the, the quality and file build type stuff, and 120 trained in investigative skills. So they, these sort of things overlap. So I think there's one thing that it's, it's obviously important that we invest in the front end in training, but then the second bit is about effective supervision. And then the third bit, which I've touched on a few times, is the quality assurance and performance review. So that you can show that there are consistent standards across the country. And that's something that happens both within the organisation, but also through the Working Together programme, where there are different strands. And indeed, I'm sure Peter might want to touch up on it. We, we do, all three of us as members of the Criminal Justice Board, get that higher level aggregate data as well. So that we try and spot trends either in court backlogs front-end problems or, or whatever it may be. And, and as a board, we're supported by uh, representatives of each of our agencies who constitute something called the Speeding Up Justice Group, and that meets on a regular basis even, uh, and really has a, a focus on uh, the, um, the ways in which we can go about addressing uh, the sorts of problems that you've identified. So uh, it's not just about big new legislative initiatives. A lot of this is about uh, how do we make operational improvements within organisations and between organisations to try to improve uh, the flow and the timeliness in which we, we proceed? And I've sort of set out at some length, including in my introductory remarks, the range of things that we're currently taking forward. And uh, you know, at each stage, we will look to evaluate, learn, and uh, move on, because it's not that, not that we're ever going to get to the end of this. There's always going to be a need to do more to try to improve the way the justice system works. And just and to what extent then do you work, we'll say, with the PPS uh, to ensure like a more uh, efficient sharing of documentation and the likes of it as well too, uh, um, uh, in order to achieve sort of successful uh, outcomes? So I'm not sure if that's aimed at, at, at me, but if I start, um, what we've done through the Criminal Justice Board is to establish a digital strategy that sets out the high-level priorities for the justice system in terms of how we advance. Uh, our, our digital approach. And our backbone for that, as Simon mentioned earlier, is the causeway system, which is an end-to-end -end case management system that begins um, at the time the crime is recorded and goes right through to the point at which there's a disposal at the court case. And in the recent upgrade, which was completed in 2019, uh, that, that case management system is, is, is pretty much a, a world first in terms of uh, capability when it was introduced 10 years ago. But what it didn't have was it didn't have a management information. Uh, it wasn't easy to get the management information out, but it was fine to follow where the case was, but you couldn't disaggregate the data. But an upgrade in 2019 means we can now begin to source that management information, which absolutely is driving our understanding of where it is that we need to improve, where the particular backlogs and difficulties are, and that's helping us to focus our efforts where we can have the biggest impact. And I know that the figure was actually quoted there on a couple of different occasions, uh, uh, and in comparison to what happens in Britain, that uh, you had a 20% change.
charged with, I think it was, yeah. Uh, and uh, But in terms of success prosecutions, how do you compare then, say, with the rest of Britain? So just, just to, I don't have the comparator to England, but I do know that the Crown Court cases, as Simon said, we have a conviction rate of 86%. The last, 2019 is the last year I have for that. That's, I think, a pretty robust figure. And if it was very much higher than that, questions would begin to be raised about whether there was fairness in the justice system. Um, so, uh, you know, there's always a balance here. Um, but I think 86% is really robust. I don't know what it would be in, yeah, in, in England. Uh, I think, um, Peter, I don't have the figures ringing in the wheels, but they are in the 80 percentile. So I think we're slightly better. They may be 82, 83, we're sort of 84, 85, 86. It'll vary year to year, and it's about 80 percent in the magistrates courts. So they're they're pretty they're pretty high in both jurisdictions. We would maybe be slightly higher. Uh, I'm not sure you can draw too much from that, um, but that, that's the sort of comparison figure. Okay, come on, thank you. Thank sorry, you. Sorry, can, uh, uh, sorry, yes. If you can't, because uh, I, I just thought sometimes you, you don't want to sort of necessarily sort of. Um, compare apples and pears, but I think it's probably important. But to put it in context to the last bit of your question, Peter, I've got some... The overall detection rate for crime in Northern Ireland is 26.9% at the end of 1920. The comparative for England Wells is 10.8%, and that then is reflected in, in, in the charge. So you've got a 20% charge rate out of that 26%, if you would me, and compared to 7% in England and Wales. So whilst... There are some subtle differences. I think, in credit to people, that is like, there's always more to do, but that's quite impressive work. Okay. Yeah, okay. well, let me say about the 100% charge rate there is just, uh, it is equally as important to know just how successful um, are the outcomes in terms of them being charged and found guilty. Well, that, that was the conviction rate, and it's that thing is, you look at this at times, the attrition at different points of the, of the journey, um, and that's about how you mine the data, as, as Peter said. Okay, Mr. Boylan. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I didn't get in earlier. Um, Clarence Interest, I had recently a case, went to the court, so I want to just um, recognise the efficiency in which the PSNA and the PPS dealt with that case. I just want to put that on record, but... Um, Chair, I just want to go back to your part about the, the adjournment, the cultural adjournments, and as probably to both Peter and Simon in relation to, you have witnesses, victims on PSNA turning up to give evidence and to go to the witness box. I mean, just to both, on to Peter in terms of what does this say to victims and witnesses in terms of, of public confidence and, and how, how they, they deal with that in particular, because it can be a difficult situation for them. And also in terms of then the same and the the time and uh, the PSNA have up here to to court. Um, just your views on that and how that impacts on the service in general. So as I as I try to draw out the distinction between adjournments per se and in particular those occasions when victims and witnesses will be expecting a trial to actually commence. And obviously Stephen might want to say something about the victim and witness unit that the PPS run, which is the key way of communicating with victims and, and witnesses as we go through that. But we are taking a number of steps to try to reduce the number of adjournments. I've mentioned the indictable cases uh, 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 approach. Uh, the uh, evaluation of that found that there were 15% fewer adjournments in those cases uh, than have been the case in 2014-2015. We also believe that committal reform should help to reduce the number of adjournments and the introduction of those case progression officers that we talked about earlier is also designed to help more cases, more issues be addressed away from the courtroom, so not to require a formal adjournment, but to enable the case to be managed still in a proactive way without bringing everybody into the courtroom at once. So those are some of the things we're doing to try to reduce the number of adjournments. But I don't know, Steve, if you want to say something about the, the yeah. interface with victims and witnesses. We recognise that you know, this is a challenge and it does cause problems when people have expectations that aren't met. Uh, no, certainly, Peter, and I think uh, just following on from that, obviously we are all conscious that there are victims and witnesses in, in these cases as well as a defendant who uh, it's a very anxious time waiting for cases to come to court. Um, whenever something doesn't proceed on the date that it's meant to, uh, that obviously unnecessarily increases the anxiety levels and that's something we all want to address. There are other measures coming out of the sort of um, 
disruption caused by the pandemic, which will improve things in the future. I think what we're finding is not every time that a, a case needs to be mentioned that needs to be done in court. You know, we are going to be looking at more things being done. Administrative mentions, for example, can perhaps be done remotely, so people will not need to be physically in the courtroom. Uh, we're trying to do some of that offline. That was uh, of necessity during the pandemic that we did have matters like um, court adjournments and mentions being done without the parties actually physically being present in the court building. And part of that is, I think Peter and Simon both talked about remote evidence centres, both for police, but also uh, we are piloting that for um, vulnerable witnesses who would benefit from not actually being in the courtroom at all, get better support from the likes of victim support from giving their evidence from a remote location. So those things are trying to address the, the quality, if you like, of the um, experience of giving evidence. But there's no doubt we all need to do more to reduce the number of hearings. And although committal reform will provide us a route into the Crown Court uh, much more quickly, there's a, a lot of work to be done, and I think the structures are already in place to ensure that um, files are case ready as much as they can be. In England and Wales, they're not completely case ready when they go to the Crown Court. There's been a proportionate file build. Uh, and the evidence is served in phases, so that the prosecution will outline uh, what its case is, but it will not have built a case like we have done by the time it comes to the Crown Court. And that's where the big cultural change will come in between the prosecution and defence having to engage and the judges having to manage that process. Um, and that, that is going to be a very big shift, but it has resulted in fewer uh, mentions and adjournments in the Crown Court in England and Wales, and I think that's where we're going to get to eventually, whenever the committal reform process is embedded. Okay. Do you want some... I think Please the question was about some police detail as well, wasn't there? So, yeah. Well, I, I think there's a few bits here. Uh, the, 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 there's the time dimension, but there's also quite an interesting role which we've not had a chance to talk about before, which is the contest mm -hmm. liaison officers, and I'll come on to what they do. But last year, uh, we were required to attend court on 32,500 times to give evidence. So um, that, that is obviously a, a significant demand. We estimate that cost the equivalent to 111 police officers if you aggregate that over the year. So just like a victim of crime, and sometimes obviously police officers are victims themselves, that is quite a, a significant commitment so that the adjournment or the timeliness affects us as an organisation just as other things. But in fairness, to try and mitigate this, this, this role I think is quite interesting because it's a central point of contact between PPS, Victim Witness Unit, Solicitors, the Judiciary, Victim Support, etc. They work with the court service to prepare court lists. They'll work with victims and witnesses if there's a change of plea. And they'll also accompany victims and witnesses to court if the case runs and remain with them while the court case is, is running. Uh, they'll chase up victims and witnesses that haven't attended court, so that Peter talked before about cracked and ineffective trials. But we don't want a, what would be an ineffective trial because a witness isn't there. So there's a series of mitigations, um, and, and then they will they will also uh, liaise with police witnesses themselves to make sure that they're still attended. So that, I thought that was um, quite an interesting one. Our, our assessment actually is they've re significantly reduced the need for, for example, investigating officers to come to court over and above the police or other witnesses just to support the PPS or the judiciary. So there. Are, there are, some, there are some impacts, but there's also some things we're trying to do to work with other people in the system to mitigate them. Mr. Boylan, if you, if you just yeah. permit me well, to... In terms, just in terms of the administrative support for the Crown Court say, judges, um, it's for Peter probably. Um, you know, could you expand a wee bit in that way that supports that available and what's been done to address that issue? I'm afraid I didn't completely catch that. No, it, I think it, the it, IT wasn't perfect. Uh, you broke up a bit there. If you could, could ask Sorry, you to repeat that. The administrative support for the Crown Court judges. Hmm. These are the, the case progression officers that have been put in place. So <clears> they're designed to help support uh, judges in, in the Crown Court areas uh, to interface with the PPS and the defence about case readiness and to help uh, advance uh, cases to the best extent possible. Uh, putting less of a burden, allowing the judges to spend more time uh, on the core judicial elements and taking some of the administrative burden away from them. And that was one of the recommendations that the Audit Office made in their report uh, in 2018. So at the moment we have six of those. We, we, did, we started with two, the trial showed they were being effective, so we've increased that to six. I think there are actually two uh, attached to the PPS, Stephen, if I'm right. Yes, and, and the role they play is really where a judge um, 
has maybe given a, a direction, ordered parties to um, have progressed a case by the next time it's in court. The case progression officers uh, in the background will contact the prosecution and defence and ensure that progress is being made there and chase those items up. And it is a very effective uh, assistance to the, the judge to make sure that there is progress and that the judge isn't having to sort of replicate some of the work that they may have to do if all that was done in the court environment. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very okay. much for your time. Okay, just before I bring Mr. Harvey in, uh, I'm just conscious, Mr. Lunny, we haven't heard from you in terms of the court service. Um, would you like to? There's been lots of conversation and questioning and answers here. I would be interested to hear in terms of the court service and from your perspective, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, for, from our uh, position, Chair, our role is to support the, the judiciary in, in the management of cases. So, so you, you, you probably have heard quite a bit about what we've been doing in terms of case progression officers, in terms of the uh, recovery from COVID, uh, and hopefully some of those figures uh, speak for themselves. Um, the we also work work very closely with the judiciary uh, in relation to the the procedural aspects so uh, one of the issues that came up in the context of the report was around the case management protocol um, and, and that's been discussed earlier in the meeting in the context of statutory case management um, along with the the presiding judge for the uh, crown court liaison committee uh, we worked to uh, basically to, to re refresh the, the case management protocol, uh, and it was published again in November 2019. Um, and as part of that, there was a huge amount of work done, both in relation to judicial training and engagement with the legal profession through the, the use of CPD events. Uh, and it was all about trying to give new new impetus to, to case management to, to try and uh, make the, the systems more uh, effective. Um, the, the new practice direction also included uh, more detailed material around protocols for victims and witnesses and for vulnerable victims and defendants. So uh, there, there has been a, a, a real focus on on just trying to improve efficiency uh, across the, the courts um, and and although COVID has clearly had an impact on, on our uh, outstanding caseloads, again, we're, we're working very closely with the judiciary and partners who are in the room with you there uh, to, to try and recover that as quickly as possible. And can I just ask, in terms of resources, uh, I mean, from your perspective in terms of the Northern Ireland Court Service, I mean, have you got, in your, from your perspective, from your opinion, have you got enough resource to help the, um, improve the situation as it sits at the moment? Uh, I, I think we, we work very closely um, with, with the department and with, with NICSHR to, to ensure that our, our vacancies are filled as quickly as possible. Uh, I, I think that uh, certainly the, the recovery work has created some pressures for us. Um, but, but we are, we, we, we're making use of additional resource through agency staff or through bringing uh, additional staff in of uh, available supply lists to, to, to manage that. So I, I believe we are managing that effectively. Uh, at some grades, for example, court clerk grade, which is quite, quite specialist, it, it's an EO1 grade. Uh, there, there were some delays in, in getting supply, but that wasn't peculiar to the court service. That was a, a, a general issue. Um, but, but no, I, I mean, I, I, I would be positive about the, the, the resource position and, and the support that we've had from the department in relation to that. I, I mentioned earlier, Chair, we've made a bid to the centre for mm. some money to help recovery, and that would be to help employ additional court clerks, for example. Um, there is then a question of getting the people with the right skills in, and it's likely to be take a few months for us to get those people in, but we are working hard to try to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Mr Harvey. Thank you very much, Chair. Mr. May, Mr. Hurd, Mr. Hurd, good to see you. The PPS rely on internal staff, including panels of visit five barristers. Do you have enough, and are these panels always readily available, or could demand be better met with an increased number of panels? Could this resolve the German issues also? Uh, I think there's a couple of aspects to that question. We don't, it's, not, it's not five council we have, we've got a different, we've got a pool of council that we use in the magistrate's court um, that do some of the advocacy, do uh, arguing cases in court for us. And then in the Crown Court cases, we have a, a panel list of about 25 split amongst various um, Crown Court offices. So we don't have a shortage of council. 
I suppose one of the things um, that council don't do is take decisions on files. So that's where the prosecutors uh, would be dis distinct from the council that we use. Council can advise us in cases. We would use senior council then, which are um, where we draw off a list. They would perhaps give us advice about whether the test for prosecution is met and then argue that if it's a very serious case, you would have senior counsel involved. So I don't think we have any issue with uh, the number of counsel available. What we probably do have um, some difficulties with is our funding situation because uh, we're always in the region of 1.5 to 2 million short. And whenever we make bids in year, they're usually met, I have to say, by the Department of Finance. But we're running with about 61 uh, agency staff at the minute. Most of those are administrative grade uh, in a similar position to Peter. Um, we're looking to increase those to help us through the COVID recovery um, planning, but it doesn't allow us to then tackle our, our planning, our resourcing in a very sustained way. We only get one year budget settlements. So I'd like to think that if we can get back to a cycle of having you know, a five year budget planning uh, and have the certainty of that, we can address the resourcing issues that we have as regards staff. Um, your crime to conviction, I mean, you said there you have a charge rate of one in five. That's very good. Uh, it's just the time, it's like 50% more time to get to this stage in England. Uh, I know you've said maybe more complex here, but do you think you can improve on that? Oh yeah, I, I, I think the different. I mean, I wouldn't try to pretend necessarily because the, the, the general nature of how crimes change across the UK is broadly similar. So you've seen broadly a fall in what we describe as acquisitive crime, you know, your burglary, thefts, etc., an increase in in violence, sexual crime, domestic abuse, things like that. So um, I think when you look at the and I'm thinking it, you might have the figure in front of you is the first one ten days and it goes to ninety three on the on the chart. And I think um, I, I think just just in the difference between uh, us and England and Wales is that obviously we, we authorise our own charging here which is different to the system in England and Wales. There are occasions when the police in England and Wales in urgency can charge but, 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 but would we do it here? So the, 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 I think the key sort of thing to look at is making sure that we have case ready files to go to Stephen and his colleagues and building the file beforehand is the issue that takes the time and I think the thing, when you look at the figures, that I, I think we would recognise that one of the things we want to look at going forwards is there's two routes broadly to get into the system. So you've got the ones that you charge. So it might be a serious case that's happened and they're charged and go to court the next day, uh, or a serious case that's charged and they, you know, they're bailed to court within a short period of time. I think the one that needs more scrutiny is those that are people that are arrested and then released on the report. So it's slightly different to being on bail. So there's 5,000 plus each year that in the charge route, but I think it's 13,000 in the report route. And I think that's an area where both Stephen and I recognise that we want to put more effort to scrutinise the investigation in that space, because that there is a difference in, the, in some of the timeliness. So that would be an area in the year ahead we want to see either we have to work out how we get more into the charge pot or more scrutiny of those in, in, in the reporting part, because there would be, from my experience, a, a difference there between here in England and Wales, although I don't have the precise figures in front of me, but that clearly is, is one of the levers we should look at this year. And you mentioned there was an increase in one individual crime of 325 per cent. Do you think that there's an actual increase in crime, or do you think your detection's better, that you're doing your job better? Well. I, I, this is always one of the conundrums, isn't it? In, in certain types of crime, which you would say that, that hidden crime, um, you know, domestic abuse, certain types of sexual crime, there is always this narrative across policing and not just here that sometimes when crime goes up, people will say it's because there's more confidence and equally when it goes down, it's because we'll be more effective. I think there's a whole separate criminological debate about whether that's entirely <laughs> accurate or not. Um, so, um, but I, I do think obviously as the Chair said earlier, you, you can't ignore the correlation that if people think there is justice with all the caveats of fair justice, it will give them more confidence to, to step forwards. Uh, I think the crime figures, I was just looking for the ones you, you, you'd be, be quoting on, because I think the, the, the huge percentages from recollection were the ones that had an online footprint, 
So, so I think the one I quoted for before Ms. Tranna Farmer figures was, I think it was, we were saying that, for example, violence against a person between 2010 and 2019 had gone up 40%, so that's the actual crime. But it was then, in the similar period, um, the, the amount of crime that had an online sort of tag to it of the same category, that was the 600% increase or the 300% increase. So, for example, sexual offences, the online presence was, was 325%, but the actual increase is still big. That was 84.6%. So it's, it's just a reflection of how we will use digital evidence to either put someone at a scene or, for example, through texts, photographs, etc., to prove or, indeed, as themes that disprove certain assertions in those relationship-type crimes. And if I could just ask, you mentioned um, earlier on your fixed penalties. You've been talking to the Infrastructure mm. Minister. Um, a larger group of these, you're maybe thinking of adding into the fixed penalty thing. What's your next steps? When do you think you could maybe progress that? Well, I, w <laughs> I have to sort of check the conventions of this group, what I'm supposed to say in terms of a meeting with the minister, but <laughs> so I don't cause another crisis. But it was... Um, <laughs> It was, um, it, was, it was a very productive meeting yesterday. There was commitment with the Minister and her officials to, to see within the time of this Assembly, can we look at some enabling legislation to, to help, help us happen. The big one we would see is careless driving. Um, and there, there, are other, there are other kindred ones, but it's, it's not the same sort of volume. And I think there was general consensus if we can do that and change a summons into a fixed penalty notice, it would be better for everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hey, Mr. Howard, thank you. Mr. O'Toole. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for coming. Um, most, of, uh, most of the key issues have been covered, but I just wanted to ask um, you all members of the Criminal Justice Board, um, what are the actual metrics that you are testing yourselves against in terms of speeding up justice? So um, we have quite a detailed um, a performance dashboard that we look at on a monthly or quarterly basis, depending on the frequency we've been meeting monthly in the last 18 months or so. Um, and as Stephen said, that breaks each case down into five separate uh, areas, looking at the, the five stages of a, of a case progression. And it also allows us to look by court area uh, and so on. So um, through the Speeding Up Justice uh, group, we, we try to, uh, they try to identify for us the issues that are of most importance, try to draw those to our attention, and then we can look at whether the steps that we already are taking uh, are likely to produce positive change in relation to those, or whether there are new actions that are going to be needed. So I'd have no problem if the committee wished to see a copy of the kind of dashboard that we, we look at regularly, sharing that with you. It's, slightly hard to explain a row of figures. Um, there are some high-level targets, of course, in the programme for government around reducing, um, uh, increasing the timeliness of cases. Um, and the benchmark figure we've been aiming for from 2016 was 139 days. As I said, immediately prior to COVID, we got the, the figures down to 149 days. So we still had a, a progress to make, but we were going in the right direction. We had five quarters of uh, continued improvement at the collective level. Um, we know, I think, that the, the biggest issue we face at the moment is the Crown Court summons cases, and that's where a lot of our work is being focused at the moment. There's a research project that is well underway, which will hopefully produce some evidence that will help us to understand better, to really get underneath the detail. You'll understand how complex some of these issues are, and what it takes is to really understand the detail and to get to the right the right pieces of information that will actually help us to make the difference um, because this is an area where it, it's all too easy to uh, to make a change and to believe it will produce a positive outcome and then to find in the end that it hasn't actually done quite what we all hoped it would do um, and that's you know a lot of what we spend our time on i don't know if colleagues want to add anything uh, i think in terms of performance metrics um certainly we, we do have a lot of uh, data now and I think that's been a, a lot of work I have to give credit to the Department of Justice and the Speeding Up Justice team in trying to extract data from the case management system was really to track live cases it wasn't meant to be a, a something that was used for performance measurement 
But as well as the overall number of days taken to dispose of cases, I think we need to look in the future at the number of cracked and ineffective trials, whether we can do more to keep ourselves on the right track of reducing those, and also the number of adjournments. So I think we've talked at quite a bit of length about the impact adjournments can have. So uh, this idea that fewer more effective hearings uh, whenever we get committal reform brought in is something I think we'll be looking at as a board. So, sorry. So there are you do have a there is a perform there is a performance dashboard which includes so there are high level targets in the PFG and there's a performance there's a dashboard which you look at uh, at your monthly uh, board meetings. So we can see. Yeah. Yes. I suppose a good example of it uh, was around the recovery in the Magistrates Court because what it was able to tell us in, in a way we hadn't been able to sort of um, find before with real lifetime lifetime data. Uh, whenever we put additional resources into the Magistrates Court, so between so, sort of September, December, January uh, last year uh, and early this year, we were operating at about 120% capacity, and that was very effective in getting through the work in the Magistrates Court. Obviously, it's a lot more complex uh, to tackle the delay in the Crown Court. Um, it, it's a much more involved process in trying to deal with Crown Court cases than it is in, in cases which are really in summary jurisdiction and the issues aren't as complex. But we did find, primarily for the use of overtime and additional courts being brought in uh, without additional staff, we were able to operate at 120% for a short period of time and that had a, a really significant impact. So that was all uh, work that we were able to do through the Criminal Justice Board and through the Speeding Up Justice team to give us that data which you know showed us the and the impact putting additional res resource into that particular area had. And the court service produced data that was able to demonstrate the number of new cases coming into the system each month and the number of cases that were being uh, resolved each month. And we were able to see through, through that that in the magistrates' court we were making a substantial dent in the, uh, the backlog that had been built up. We still, are, we still have more to do in the Crown Court. As I said, it's going to take us longer to recover the Crown Court. Um, okay, I think um, it would be helpful if I could suggest, Chair, that we, if um, witnesses could provide us with, with the dashboard and, a, and, a, 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 and just a summary of um, uh, the, the view on, on, on the most important metrics that they're testing themselves against. Okay, I don't think there's any difficulty with that, yep. I don't have anything else, thank you. Thank you. Um, just before I move on, Mr. Lunny, can I ask you, in terms of the um, what we now establish is an, uh, an average of nine adjournments uh, across the, the, the Crown Courts, what practical implications does that have for you and your workforce? Uh, Obviously, the, 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 the more number of adjournments that a case has, the more court time is being taken up. Um, through the case progression officer pilot and, and through the work being done in general to, to improve uh, the, the management of cases, if we can drive down the, the number of uh, adjournments that would happen in, in a typical case, we, we can free up court time, we can free up staff time, and we can ensure that resources are being used for the stages of the cases which are, are most meaningful uh, rather than, than having cases listed for relatively short uh, adjournments. Okay, thank you. Mr. Beggs. <clears throat> uh, uh, hello there again. Thanks for your contribution so far. Uh, I'd like to go back to the issue of adjournments uh, and the delays and I dare say the uh, associated cost. Uh, and I'm very mindful of the, the comment that justice delayed is justice denied. Um, when I look at the public, at the audit office report, it indicates that the Department of Justice per head of population is 82% higher than uh, England and Wales. Policing is 161% higher per head of population than England and Wales. Prosecution 70% higher and the courts 50% higher. Uh, per head of population, uh, yet when you look at what the outcomes of all that extra money is, it is, um, I have to say, shockingly disappointing. Um, an average of 115 days uh, average time from, from crime to completion, uh, some 12% uh, of uh, 
cases taking more than a thousand days. A thousand days. That's that's going towards uh, th three years. Um, uh, and an average has had others have said of six and a half adjournments uh, uh, w with cases. Um, so my question to each of you is, what has gone wrong, and how? Why is it taking so long to fix? Because this is something that I understand has been worked at for decades. Okay. Well, look, I'll start with that. Thanks for the question. Um, and I mean, I think what I would start by saying is. You, sh you cannot measure the effectiveness of a justice system purely by time taken. So there is a quality dimension to this that is really important. And the information we provided around the number of people convicted, around the, the proportion of uh, recorded crimes that lead to charges and to convictions are very relevant, I think, and should not be overlooked. The reality is that uh, if we, the, the figures I have it before me, looking at all cases, and comparing England and Wales and Northern Ireland in average case processing times, uh, as of 2019, we were progressing all cases quicker than England and Wales. So our average time was 149 days in 2019. It was 164 days in England and Wales. Uh, so, and in the 10 years previous, England and yeah, Wales had an increase. Mr. My, my, my question is not just the time to progress a case, it's the time from the crime until the completion of the case. So you can pick out elements that might produce so, nice numbers, but for the victim, it's the time from uh, the, the crime until the completion of the case that is important. So I think there is a small difference in the way in which case times um, are measured here, but those averages are that time. It is from beginning to end. It's not, um, it's not one part of the process. So um, uh, just, to, just, to, just to reassure you, what we've seen over 10 years is an, is an overall 8% reduction in average uh, case progression time for all cases. In England and Wales, we've seen an increase of 23%. So um, that's, that's not to hide the problem that we have, which is essentially with Crown Court cases, and particularly Crown Court summons cases, which are skewing the figures. You mentioned specifically cases that might take over 1,000 days, and I'm going to ask Stephen to say a little bit more about that, but we do need to recognise there are a variety of reasons why a case might take a long time. One of which is that there could be satellite litigation. In other words, people could be litigating which, on a matter that means the case needs to be held uh, pending the resolution of another case. Um, equally, uh, as colleagues have explained, particularly the increase of sexual and violent offending, the, the, the challenge and complexity around the progression of the case, uh, the readiness, for example, of the victim to give evidence and so on can all make a difference. So I would absolutely accept that the number of cases taking more than 1,000 days is unacceptable and we need to do something to reduce that. But I would guard against the view that says no case should take 1,000 days because I do not believe that is either achievable or will be the sign of a good justice system. Stephen, I wonder if you want to add to that. Yeah, yes, I think I, I will. And obviously, the audit office report uh, was in 2018. And speaking from the sort of prosecutor perspective uh, in 2019, in recognition of well, an additional pledge from the government to get to um, fund 20,000 police officers in England and Wales, the CPS was given additional yearly funding of 85 million pounds to recruit additional prosecutors. And it wasn't just the sort of match fund. The increase with police with a, a resulting increase in, in prosecutors. It was in recognition of the same crime trends that, that uh, Simon mentioned earlier, where the more complex crime um, had increased in England and Wales. Certainly, the volumes of cases being dealt with the, the justice system has reduced, but the complexity of them has increased. And in terms of Simon talked about 4,777 mobile phones having to be looked at at the unit. If you think that one gigabyte of data uh, equates to about 20,000 pages, and you know you take an iPhone 12, for example, and I'm sure police have seized many of those um, types of phone where they have capacity storage of about 256 gigabytes. That's about 50 million pieces of paper. So part of the funding for the CPS was in recognition of the huge complexity and the changing nature of crime, you know, encrypted devices, all those things take a lot of time, and those will be the cases that come out at the thousand end, the thousand day end of the spectrum of cases.
because a lot of sexual offence cases, drugs cases, there will be relevant material on digital devices that, that will take a long time to deal with. Um, now, rather than just put resources in it, you also have to try and focus on reasonable lines of inquiry, because as I've said before, I think part of the problem in this jurisdiction is the culture of overbuilding cases, and it's not a deliberate thing that police uh, and PPS are doing uh, because we are, you know, have higher standards of quality. It's just we can't anticipate um, where the defence are going to challenge the case on, and that causes unnecessary resources being put into that. And there needs to be a duty of engagement with the defence at an earlier stage, so the issues can be narrowed, and there's less actual forensic analysis done by police and those who assist them with that uh, will be part of the solution there. Oh, just, just a couple of bits, maybe just to clarify as well, because obviously there, there is clearly, that ultimately there's this question to be asked, isn't it, about the, the inputs in terms of cost and then the outputs and outcomes in terms of court cases and justice. But I think um, there is a contextual thing, because Stephen talked about uplifts in, in England and Wales in terms of budgets. And I know your challenge is, are you doing enough of what you've got? But I think it's about reminding members, and obviously it comes from another audit office report, that the PSNI suffered the single biggest single cut to its resources in the period of austerity. Um, and obviously that's still a matter for the, the new, new, new Deal issue. And in real terms, the system has seen an 18% cut over the time of this report in its resources. And effectively, from our point of view, policing, the, the, the net effect has been, we've, we've, although the amount has gone up, um, I think from 704 million in 2016-17 to 745 million last year, taking account of inflation, that's really sort of sort of standstill. And like for like is sometimes difficult because obviously hidden within our budget is that sort of um, bounce effect, if you like, for the, the unique circumstances of the terrorist and security threat. The complexity of the terrorism investigation side, which is a big piece of the thousand days, frankly, and also the, the amount of resource we have to set aside compared to other places to deal with public order and, and the issues that go with it. So that the proportion sometimes of frontline activity will differ across police services uh, between you know, here and, and, uh, and England and Wales. So I am conscious, probably all are, about there is a value for money question here, but there are other reasons where resources go to other things. Do you all acknowledge, I hope you all acknowledge that um, um, each, each are higher funded than their comparisons in, the, in, the, in the England and Wales, uh, and yet the collective output, uh, you're all working together in the justice system, is, is producing poor outcomes. Uh, in terms of witnesses, um, can I ask the, the court service why two thirds of witnesses called are not required to give any evidence? Is that purely down to all these adjournments when they're called, but then uh, because of items that are missing, uh, they don't actually uh, get called to, to, to give evidence? Uh, the, the reason for a contest not going ahead on, on any given day whenever witnesses there could, can vary. I mean, it, it, it could be that uh, it, it is an ineffective date and therefore it needs to be adjourned for a further contest to be set. Uh, and the causes for that, again, can, can be can be various. It could be uh, the absence of material. It could be some of the issues that were, were to be dealt with haven't been resolved. But equally, an awful lot of cases can can resolve uh, on on the day itself, uh, which is where you get your your cracked dates from. So, uh, although the witness has come along to court, uh, they're not required to give evidence because the case has resolved either by way of a, a guilty plea or, in some cases, the, the the charges some of the charges may be withdrawn. Um, so, so, so there, there's, there's, there are, there are differing factors at play there. Would you accept? Is it not strange that sometimes it takes uh, sorry, there's a relatively uh, low proportion proportions of guilty pleas come in uh, at the first hearing, and it may take four, five, or six hearings before uh, the uh, defendant pleads guilty. Is that not an indication of failing in the process? I think there. 
there's probably a, a culture issue there, uh, and I think there's the the, the fact that uh, quite quite often, particularly at the lower level of courts, um, discussions between the defence and their clients and the defence and the prosecution will take place in the court on on the day that a matter is listed. Um, so so that that and, and culture, as you'll appreciate, isn't isn't an easy thing to change. Hopefully, through the modernisation programme, which is being taken forward for, for the court service in particular, but across justice, um, the ability to manage cases digitally, the ability to um, have the parties talking and exchanging digitally will allow that culture to change. There, there shouldn't be the same need for, for um, barristers on the defence side to be talking to the prosecution at the last minute. All, all that should be sorted out uh, at a much earlier stage. Uh, one, of, one of the points in the report is to ensure that there would be uh, additional staff resources uh, in, in managing that court system, um, ensure that necessary processes are completed, that, uh, that all critical evidence is, is, is available, and to ensure that there's an accurate record of why a case would be adjourned. Is that yeah. happening? Uh, yeah, well, that, that touches upon two different issues. We, we obviously have the, the case progression officer uh, pilot, which, which has been touched upon before, and, and the fact that as a result of uh, it is still subject to a formal evaluation, which which I understand NISRA will take forward this year. It was to be last year, but as a result of COVID was, was, was pushed back. Uh, but even on the basis of the anecdotal results that we have had from that, um, the, the department agreed to, to fund the, the rollout of, of case progression officers to all areas. The data for um, cracked and effective trials, which is what the second part of the, the issue touched upon, we stopped we stopped collecting that as a formal national statistic, but we still routinely collect it uh, as management information. So that, that information is still available. Uh, and Peter touched earlier upon some of the, the findings that we've seen there in terms of the reduction of cracked and effective mm -hmm. trials. There is an issue which we will work closely with the judiciary to resolve. At the minute, we are collecting that largely administratively, uh, and where where a case doesn't proceed, the court clerk who is in the courtroom uh, makes a, a, an assessment or a determination of what he thinks is the dominant cause of the delay, or the, sorry, the dominant cause of the adjournment. That, that's not always immediately apparent, and that was one of the reasons we stopped publishing the, the figures as national statistics. In England and Wales, the judiciary, in England and Wales, when a case is adjourned like that, the, the, the judge and the prosecutor and the defence will all stop and agree between them what the cause of the delay was, and that will be recorded, and I think that's probably where we want to get that to. Is that not a fairly basic uh, 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 scheme of, of managing the courts? I, I, I'm surprised you're saying that's where you want to get to. No, no. Should, it, it, uh, it, sorry. So I'm just to, to add that extra layer of, of assurance around the figures. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything substantially uh, out of kilter with the management information that we're collecting. Um, but okay. but to, to, to do it in exactly uh, all fours with how it's done in England and Wales, which is, is a, a Sajini recommendation, uh, would probably just give us that layer of, of additional assurance, uh, which, which would be important. Would you accept that uh, aside from uh, the court cost of adjournment, there is a huge cost for a range of individuals, uh, witnesses, victims, time off uh, their own place of work or unable to carry out their normal uh, duties, perhaps sleepless nights the night before to find that the, the case is regularly adjourned and they've went through the whole trauma, the incident, a number of times. So do you accept that the, the justice system collectively is uh, causing unnecessary stress uh, on victims and witnesses in not running efficiently. Uh, I could just come in on that point and try to answer the members' question. So not every adjournment will have a victim or a witness present. Uh, it, as a, we keep coming back to, it's the points at which the victim or witness were expecting a case to progress that is the issue. The most recent victim and witness survey, which was conducted by the department, recorded a significant fall in the number of witnesses who reported they had to attend court on more than one occasion. So it fell from 35% in 2016-17 to 19% in 2019-20. So that 19% remains the number that we absolutely need to go after and try to reduce. But I didn't want you to have a sense or anyone to have the, the sense that 
Because there are nine adjournments, the witness is present nine times. That would not normally be the case. In fact, it would be very much the, the extraordinary case that that would be the, that would be the situation. Um, so it was just to clarify that particular point in case there was a misunderstanding. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, in terms of actual court time, um, is there any attempt to uh, put a figure on the cost per hour, bearing in mind all the overheads, so that there is focus on uh, efficient use of that time, either by the department or the court service? So the report does reference uh, activity-based costings, um, and that is a path that, uh, you know, I'm, I have to say I'm not convinced it would be a sensible path to go down, um, because an activity-based costing scheme system essentially requires time recording by all of the justice agencies, and uh, that would be, you know, it's one thing to do that if you're an accountancy firm wanting to charge out and bill uh, your clients. It's another thing, I think, to put into a public sector environment that sort of uh, a very administratively burdensome uh, regime. What we are looking at instead, and we have a research project that will look at this, is whether we can offer some cost about what the cost of delay in the justice system is. And um, you know, it's in the nature of these research projects, especially ones that are quite challenging, as this one will be, I suspect, quite hard to know how successful the research project will be, but we are going to try and see whether we can identify better what the cost of delay is. And, and by saying delay, we mean delay that needs to be avoided rather than the time it will inevitably take for cases to go through the system. So that's the way in which we're looking to progress <coughs> that. And it's a way of trying to uh, see if we can find a, a, a sensible way of understanding the, 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 the financial impact without creating some system that would be very burdensome. I, I fully appreciate the benefit in having uh, a, a, an over-bureaucratic system, but is there any even estimate of uh, the number of hours in the court each year and the total cost of the court service? And then there would be a focus on roughly what it costs for each, each hour in court so that everybody will have a focus on uh, achieving justice and also achieving value for money in, in court, uh, courtroom time. Can you produce a figure of the number of hours um, in, in, in the criminal court each year and the cost of running those courts? Um, I, I don't think that that data certainly isn't readily available at the moment. Um, and I'm not even confident that the research project I've described would provide that, uh, that information and that evidence. Um, I think particularly in a world where, um, Stephen mentioned earlier, our desire to see more business transacted virtually uh, outside the courtroom and less in the formal courtroom, it's actually going to make it very much more difficult to, to, to create postings that are absolutely uh, clear and transparent. So, of course, we can make some high-level estimates about what the cost of running a trial for an hour would be and, and so on. But it's really understanding, uh, and we need, to, we need to understand, I think, what's the purpose of gathering the information and how we use that information to help to advance the common cause that we all have, which is to reduce the amount of time that will be taken. Do, do you have a figure of courtroom number of hours in the court each year? And then we can just look at the funding that went to the court service each year and get a very high level estimate. So can you provide that to us subsequently? I, I don't believe we need to hold that information, but I'm going to ask Peter Looney, who's on the call, whether he believes that information exists. Uh, it's not something that, that's readily available. We, uh, previously, whenever we were looking at the court of state, along with the criminal justice inspectorate, they, they came up with a very rudimentary cost model uh, per venue, uh, which, which, showed, which, which looked at the number of sitting days rather than sitting hours and, and the number of cases that were dealt with. And, and that, would give you, that would give you a very um, basic uh, comparison. And, and you will see that there's a, a, a big variation between different venues just because of the, the, na the nature of buildings and the fact that some are modern and more efficient, some are old and, and underutilised. Um, so so it, it has been done before in a very basic way, Mr Beggs, um, but, but it's, it's not something that we, we readily have available. Uh, I, I would appreciate a copy of the previous uh, rough, yep. rough uh, estimates. I think that, that is useful for everyone to focus. I'll turn then...
Um, Mr. Beggs, I have to advise you that you've frozen. I don't know whether you can hear me, but certainly we can't hear you and you're frozen on the screen. <coughs> Okay, um, while we're waiting to try and re-establish link, can I just ask, um, I'm mindful, Chief Constable, when you, you talk about um, your, your number of officers, and I am mindful that there was a commitment in NDNA for more officers for the police, uh, and that's why the full implementation of NDNA is important, uh, frankly. Um, most crime happens at the weekend, yes? Can I ask, therefore, in terms of the PPS, um, have you considered, Stephen, a, a, a peer review of the efficiency of the PPS as it compared to other jurisdictions in the UK? It is difficult to do, and like for like comparison, Scotland is so very different. You know, it, it doesn't bear comparison really. If you look at England and Wales, uh, what we have found is that there's a lot more can be done remotely. Uh, CPS do have a system called CPS Direct, which is sort of like a telephone advice for police. Uh, we've seen through working together that there is benefits in closer working between police and PPS. And certainly on the occasions when sort of out of hours advice is required, uh, we find it's quite an exceptional need, but we can, we can meet that. I don't think there would be um, any benefit in sort of a routine weekend service or anything like that. I don't think that would okay. provide can any I, benefit. Okay. Can I just ask then, in terms of the, the, the line of questioning Mr. Beggs was pursuing, in terms of the Crown Court, have we reached a situation now where we have a fixed cost for Crown Court cases? Would you like to say a little more, Chair, just so that I make sure I understand the question I'm trying to well, ask? Well, what I'm saying is um, there will be a lot of Crown Court cases will be repetitive, similar. Uh, I mean, are we, are we in a situation where a lot of, the, you know, that the you can give a cost and those being... Uh, almost at a fixed, I mean, is there an open-ended um, situation whereby we can have nine or more, because nine's the average um, adjournments, and therefore each time the cost just mounts and mounts and mounts? I mean, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, most adjournments will take, you know, Stephen will get me right, they might take a minute or two uh, in, a, in, a, in a court, or some will take longer. Yeah, and, and in some adjournments there, are, there is business done, so you could have an application that is heard. It's not necessarily that uh, when a matter is adjourned there hasn't been any progress made in the case. Sometimes uh, an application for <coughs> special measures or hearsay could be done at the time uh, that the adjournment is made, so it's not that there's no value in adjournments or, or that they're all unnecessary at all. Yeah. Okay, well look, it looks to me to my screen, Mr. Beggs has dropped out. Um, so, any other member, any question? Okay. Um, there may be other questions that Mr. Beggs would have wanted to have asked. Um, so, if you'd like to write to us, we'd be happy yes, to respond we'll, in writing yeah, if that's okay, okay Chair. Look, can I, can I thank you all very much um, for your time here today? Um, and it's been very useful. Uh, and I wish you well, we wish you well in your uh, efforts to try and and make the, the system much more efficient uh, and, and uh, obviously make Northern Ireland a better and safer place. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Um, so can I, in thanking our, uh, our colleagues for, for their appearance here today, I'd also like to thank Mr. Stevenson. Uh, for, for his attendance and Mr Lunny uh, as well who both joined us remotely. Thank you very, very much gentlemen. Okay, okay, okay. members um, can I just then say that we will now go into closed session and uh, so I declare session now in closed. Island Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed.